look at it. <laughs> and no heads up, nothing. <sighs> already there. It would have been nice. Thank you, everyone, for coming uh, tonight for the city council meeting of Monday, May the 2nd, 2022. Uh, we will start uh, with a roll call. Mayor McCachron? Here. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Here. Councilor Tabor? Here. Councilor Denton? Here. Councilor Moreau? Here. Councilor Bagley is absent this evening. Councilor Lombardi? Here. Councilor Blaylock? Here. Councilor Cook? Here. Uh, and before the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, I would like uh, Portsmouth to think of, of two people. Uh, first, uh, Michael O'Leary, uh, hairstylist. He, he cut my hair, gave me my first really cool haircut, I think, in middle school. Um, he was a member of the Coast Guard uh, and longtime uh, Portsmouth resident. Uh, lost his battle to uh, pancreatic cancer uh, a few days ago. Uh, and would also like to remember um, John Hazen Bagley, um, and if the name sounds familiar, uh, that's Councillor Bagley's father, uh, also brother to uh, Dick Bagley, who often speaks here at City Council. Uh, he was a high school math teacher uh, before he became a restaurateur and then uh, retired uh, in Georgia. Our hearts go out to the Bagley family uh, as they uh, look to remember uh, their father uh, and brother. Moment of silence, please. Now, if you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have some proclamations. The first uh, proclamation I'd ask uh, for Mike Nelson, president of the Portsmouth uh, Laureate Program, uh, to please come to the, uh, the podium uh, and start us off. Hello, is this thing on? Yes. We can hear you. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor McEachern, Assistant Mayor Kelly, City Councilors and staff, invited guests. My name is Mike Nelson. I'm the chair of the board of the trustees of the Portsmouth Poet Laureate Program. On behalf of the PPLP, I want to thank the City Council for once again making this ceremony a part of their proceedings. The Portsmouth Port Laureate Program was founded in 97 by Nancy Moorhill, aided by Paula Race, Mimi White, and others. From that day to this, all the work of the program has been done by volunteers who contribute both time and money. We are entirely funded by individual donations and grants from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. The mission of the PPLP is to build community through poetry. We do that in two ways. First, through the monthly, monthly poetry group the first Wednesday of each month, September through June, which was started by our second poet laureate, Robert Dunn, and is now in its 23rd year. Secondly, we select a poet laureate every two years with the help of a separate and independent selection committee made up of a diverse group of artists and public servants from this community. The poet laureate then works with the board and volunteers to create engaging community building projects with poetry always at its heart. For the past three years, our 12th Poet Laureate, Tammy Truax, has been building a bridge to Japan and Japanese poetry by connecting with Portsmouth's sister city, Nishinan, Japan. Tammy has kept the community here and there on the other side of the world engaged with the fine art of Japanese poetry and art throughout a global pandemic, a time we can all agree that community building was more <coughs> important than ever. And because of that, the work she did became more than building community she was building hope. I am so pleased to welcome to the podium the 12th Poet Laureate, Tammy Truax. Thank you. Long before COVID-19 surfaced, I had envisioned a project that would use poetry as a way to build bridges. 
the idea seemed just right for our little city. I was especially interested in building interest in and involve more people, children and adults, poets and non-poets, in building a more inclusive and celebratory relationship with our sister city of Nichinan. I knew that Japan has a Fuji Mountain-sized wealth of poetic gifts to share, and that learning about them would be a beautiful way to forge cultural appreciation. Well, COVID curdled all of my original plans repeatedly, and they ended up reworking the educational workshops for all ages and the broadside gallery and celebration in virtual formats. The upside of that was that they can all be found online still. I was pleased to bring local educator Masako Moore, UNH professor Monica Chu, and renowned Japanese poetry scholar and poet Patrick Donnelly to help me deliver those programs. We also partnered with several organizations to pull that off, including the Music Hall, the Portsmouth Public Library, and the New Hampshire Humanities Council. As a Portsmouth public school teacher librarian, much of my focus was on involving children in my project. We gave as gifts 100 copies of Little Poems for Tiny Ears with a local illustrator, well, New Hampshire illustrator. Um, we gave those to local newborns. We shared a digital resource of Japanese poetry, educational ideas and resources with hundreds of local educators and purchased a set of Japanese poetry related books for all three elementary school libraries. COVID also gave something to my tenure that had never been part of the plan when I began writing a weekly poem for the city's news bulletin. I thought those poems would be read by only a fraction of our local population. I was wrong. One of them was translated and read at the 2020 graduation ceremony of nurses in Nichinan. Then when a news story by New Hampshire's Holly Raymer of the AP ran, the story went viral. Just some of the places, just a sampling of the places that reported on the Portsmouth pandemic poems, as they were called, were The Observer in La Grande, Oregon, <clears throat> The Day in New London, Connecticut, The Taiwan News and The Arkansas News Online, The Democrat and Chronicle in Rochester, New York, KSNT News in Kansas, CNN, The Washington Post, and The New York Times twice. I was asked to do several radio shows about the poems, one here at WSCA, one with the Movers and Shakers program at iHeartRadio, and one with the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation out of Toronto. Especially thrilling to me was that the story was featured on Newzella, which is a carefully curated news outlet for school children all over the country who have to read the article and also do a lesson about the article. Of course, people from all over the world reached out to me after. So many nice notes. One, an elderly woman who remembered <coughs> being my teacher decades ago. But the majority were complete strangers who just wanted to send a compliment. One man wrote from Belfast, Ireland, and another from Mexico who included a picture of the AP article in Spanish. Because one of my goals with the original project was to encourage artistic collaboration, it was wonderful to hear from artists who wanted to collaborate with me after they'd read one of the city poems. A reader in San Francisco was inspired by my poem about the passing of Justice Ginsburg to paint a portrait of the justice, which she shared along with my poem on her blog. And I heard from a member of a choir in Princeton, New Jersey, who wanted to set one of the poems to music for their own pandemic programming. Here at home, the PPLP board was inspired to publish a book about my project, for which I am quite thankful. But most gratifying of all was hearing from people that the poems helped. One woman wrote of how my haiku about getting through a dark night helped her get through a very dark week. So many serendipitous surprises, so many. Perhaps, just perhaps, you can imagine my great surprise when Fox News had something nice to say about me. <laughs> but I shouldn't have been surprised, for that is what poetry can do. It can build bridges. It can heal hurts. It can calm tempers. It can cross stormy oceans, even when no stars can be seen to guide us. While I didn't get to do many of the things I set out to do three years ago, we did a lot. And I thank you all for your support of me, my project, the PPLP, as we rode out that storm together. 
Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. We owe you a big debt of gratitude. Really appreciate it. And now, Dianelli Antigua is a Dominican American poet and educator. Born and raised in Massachusetts, her debut collection, Ugly Music, was the winner of the Pamet Prize and a 2020 Whiting Award. She received her BA in English from University of Massachusetts Lowell, where she won the Jack Kerouac Creative Writing Scholarship and received her MFA at NYU, where she was awarded a Global Research Initiative Fellowship to Florence, Italy. She is a recipient of additional fellowships from Canto Mundo, Community of Writers, Fine Arts Work Center Summer Program, and was a finalist for the 2021 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Poetry Fellowship. Her work has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and chosen for the Best of the Net Anthology. She lives in Portsmouth and has been a fixture at all the readings in town, where he has shown again and again that not only is she a great poet, but she also has an amazingly warm, friendly, magnetic, and enthusiastic personality. Uh, and all of these qualities are the makings of a great poet laureate. We are so grateful that she has accepted her nomination for this post and we cannot wait to get to work with her on our projects and continue this now 25-year-old tradition with the PPLP of building community with poetry in Portsmouth and beyond. And now, Mayor McEachern, will you please read the official proclamation? Whereas Portsmouth is known for its arts, culture, and history and benefits significantly both economically and spiritually from the enrichment the arts provide to residents and visitors alike, and whereas great poets have found inspiration in Portsmouth for centuries and have lent their voices to illuminating our darker sides and the angels of our better nature, and whereas April was natural, uh, National Poetry Month, celebrating the thousands of poets throughout our nation's history and among us now, including National Poet, Poets Laureates from New Hampshire like Charles Simic, Donald Hall, Maxine Cuman, and Robert Frost, and whereas Portsmouth established the Portsmouth Poet Laureate Program in 1997, 25 years ago, to build community through poetry by appointing and supporting an outstanding local poet as Poet Laureate for the city, sponsoring events that feature area poets and authors from outside the New Hampshire seacoast, and encouraging a love of poetry among people of all ages, and whereas outgoing and 12th Poet Laureate Tammy Truax magnified her position to sustain, us, to sustain us all during the pandemic with weekly poems about the darkness of the moment and about hope, an effort that brought international media attention. Now, therefore, I, Daglin McEachern, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do by hereby proclaim Diana Lee Antigua, Portsmouth Poet Laureate, for a two-year term and I urge all Portsmouth citizens to get to know the work of, of, of Portsmouth and New Hampshire poets and to explore poetry in all its shapes, colors, and sizes for the enjoyment, inspiration, insight, encouragement that poetry affords. Given with my hand and the seal of the city of Portsmouth on this second day of May, 2022. And now, the 12th Poet Laureate, Tammy Truax, will pass the quill emblematic of the Poet Laureate program to our 13th Poet Laureate, Dianelli Antigua. There's no one I would rather hand this to. Thank you, Mayor, Council, Board members, family and friends for being here today. I am humbled by this opportunity to be Portsmouth Poet Laureate. Since moving to Portsmouth in 2020, I have been welcomed and embraced 
as if I had been living here all along. It is a great privilege to serve this community and bring poetry to its people. As not only the youngest, but also the first person of color who has received this honor, it is my mission to uplift marginalized voices and identities. Although it's an immense pressure to be the first of anything, I am passionate about this mission and hope to see more representation moving forward. As for my term as laureate, it is my goal to engage the community in the transformative art that is poetry through readings, workshops, and other creative endeavors. I hope to spearhead a project that embodies the spirit of the poem, Like You, by Roque Dalton, which says, I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry, like bread, is for everyone. The idea would be to demystify poetry and bring it to the people, for the people, and by the people. Poetry does not have to be something to decode. It should be accessible to all. Likewise, I will make it a priority to involve local organizations, specifically ones like Haven, who specialize in supporting victims of abuse. Poetry has been a solve for me as I've navigated my own journey towards healing, and I would like to extend that opportunity to others. Poetry is not just about, about a love of language, but also about a love for humankind. I want to thank you all again for being here with me today and for your support. I'll close my remarks with a poem. Um, it was hard to choose one since many of my poems are very, very sad. Um, but I wanted to get a glimmer of hope at the end. And since Mother's Day is this weekend, I thought I would read one um, about mothers. And then I will end with a poem that I referenced by Rocco Dalton. We never stop talking about mothers. Renee and I hers and the urn by her desk, and mine, alive in an apartment 40 minutes from here, probably watching a telenovela or frying plantains, texting me goodnight. Renee's mother isn't really in the urn. She's in the blue wall, the beach landscape painting, the dog barking at the unexpected, the jangle of silver bracelets. We are all carrying our mothers, and we are all better daughters with the dead. She tells me I am wise, and all I can think about are the moments of my unwiseness. Driving and sipping margaritas from a water bottle, the bruise on my arm, and taking him back. Her husband is away at the family cabin and she is glad for the space. My husband doesn't exist, and I am sad for the space I make my home in. I buy sunflowers and goat cheese and throw a dinner party for the ghosts. I don't know Renee's mother's name to send a proper invitation. I don't know the names of the women in my family past my great-grandmother. So how will I call upon them when it's time. Will I call them Mary, or Venus, or Yemaya? I've yet to burn the Palo Santo, the sage. I want to leave behind a legacy of light. I want to leave someone better. And this is. Um, Roque Dalton's poem. I'm going to read it in Spanish. I'm going to try my best, and then I'm going to read it in English. So this is Like You or Como Tu by Roque Dalton. Yo, como tú, amo el amor, la vida, el dulce encanto de las cosas, el paisaje celeste de los días de enero. También mi sangre bulle y río por los ojos que han conocido el brote de las lágrimas. Creo que el mundo es bello, 
que la poesía es como el pan de todos, que mis venas no terminan en mí, sino en la sangre unánime de los que luchan por la vida, el amor, las cosas, el paisaje y el pan, la poesía de todos. Like you, I love love. Life, the sweet smell of things, the sky blue landscape of January days, and my blood boils up and I laugh through eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry like bread is for everyone and that my veins don't end in me but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life, love, little things, landscape and bread the poetry of everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dean Ellie. We are thrilled to have you as our new Poet Laureate of Portsmouth, and we can't wait to work with you and see all the amazing things that you will accomplish. Our thanks to the mayor, council, staff, volunteers, and all who helped create this evening's celebration, and all who helped to build community through poetry in Portsmouth. For those uh, watching at home or later on YouTube to learn more about uh, DNLE, Tammy, and the PPLP, you can go to our website, pplp.org, or you can go learn more about DNLE at her website, dnleantigua.com. For those who are here, please join us now for the reception and conference room to welcome our new Poet Laureate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dianelli. Um, next up, this is a tough act to follow, but <clears throat> A proclamation proclaiming, I'll just wait till everybody. A proclamation proclaiming drinking water week in Portsmouth. Whereas Portsmouth and Pease drinking water systems provide up to 6 million gallons a day of drinking water to customers in Portsmouth, Pease, Tradeport, Newington, Newcastle, Greenland, and portions of Rye, Durham, Dover, and Madbury, and whereas the city created the Safe Water Advisory Group in two, uh, October 2020 to review and communicate the latest science on the health and environmental effects of PFAS to monitor federal and state late level legislative changes and to anticipate policy changes that could impact the city of Portsmouth, and whereas the city completed construction on a new water filtration system to treat PFAS contamination and reactivated the Haven well last summer and continues to monitor, study, and track regulations to identify and treat contaminants of concern such as PFAS and lead through robust tracking and testing programs that protect the health and safety of the community. And whereas in spite of se sequential years of drought, the city has maintained a supply of enough drinking water to meet the community's demand by managing the network of wells and that tap various groundwater supplies and protecting the surface water supply at and around the Bellamy Reservoir, and whereas the city continues to work with our neighbors to create supplemental and emergency water system connections and has successfully secured both state and federal dollars to help fund these important projects for protecting future water sources and water system infrastructure, and whereas Portsmouth was the first and is currently the only water system in the state to encourage water conservation by offering financial, financial incentives for the replacement of water intensive appliances with low consumption alternatives and promotes this and other conservation initiatives through the Think Blue public information campaign. And whereas for more than 40 years, the American Water Works Association and its members, including Portsmouth Water Division here have used Drinking Water Week as a unique opportunity for both water professionals and the communities they serve to recognize the vital role water plays in our daily lives. Now, therefore, I, Daigle McCachran, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council and citizens of Portsmouth, do hereby proclaim May 1st through the 7th 
as Portsmouth Drinking Water Week and urge all Portsmouth citizens to learn about the Portsmouth Water System, the Safe Water Advisory Group, and the city's efforts to protect and maintain the quality of our drinking water by participating in the Community Water Forum on Tuesday, May the 3rd, that is tomorrow. Given with my hand in the seal of the City of Portsmouth on this second day of May 2022. Thank you. Do we have anybody collecting this? Brian here? No. Brian, I'll give that to you a little later on. <laughs> and this one, this one's a special one. And it's, it's lucky um, that we're able to, um, and I think a, a great uh, coincidence um, that we're able to celebrate this, uh, which is the Professional Municipal Clerks Week uh, on Kelly Barnaby's birthday which happens to be today. Yay. So, really? happy birthday, <laughs> Kelly. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kelly. Happy birthday to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, this is not a short one. Whereas the office of the professional municipal clerk, a time-honored and vital part of local government, exists throughout the world, and whereas the office of the professional municipal clerk is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the professional municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies, and agencies of government at other levels, and whereas professional municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and partiality, rendering equal service to all, and whereas the municipal the professional municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community, whereas professional municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the office of the professional municipal clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meeting of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations, whereas the function of the professional municipal clerk necessitate a thorough knowledge of law, procedure, administration, and interpersonal relationships, whereas professional William Bennett Monroe, author of one of the first textbooks written on the topic of municipal administration, says, no other office in municipal service has so many contacts. It services the mayor, the city council, the city manager, and all administrative departments without exception. All of them call upon it almost daily for some services or information whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Professional Municipal Clerk, whereas Kelly L. Barnaby is among 1,365 professional municipal clerks throughout the United States, Canada, and 15 other countries who has achieved the Master Municipal Clerk designation from the International Institute of Municipal Clerks. Now, therefore, I, Dagle McCachran, Mayor of the City of Portsmouth, on behalf of the members of the City Council, do hereby recognize the week of May 1st through May 7th, 2022, as Professional Municipal Clerks Week, and further extend appreciation to our professional municipal clerk, Kelly L. Barnaby, Master Municipal Clerk, and to all professional municipal clerks for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to the communities they represent given with my hand in the seal of the City of Portsmouth on this second day of May 2022. Thank you so much. All right. Thank there you, you go. very much. Thank you. All right, next up, acceptance of minutes. Uh, looking for a sample motion, move to accept and approve the minutes of the April 18th, 2022 City Council meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, next, we have uh, public comment. I have the list right here. And if you are online, please raise your hand, your virtual hand in the next minute. Uh, first up, uh, Roy Helsel um, of the topic of partners. Name's Roy Halsell, 777 Middle Road, Unit 22. Evening Mayor, City Council. I want to know if we're going to have a partnership or a dictating, dictation, dictatorship on this next agreement that we're supposed to have with the McIntyre relationship with our developer. That's all I have to say. 
Thank you, Roy. Next up, Zalita Morgan on Governance Committee and Fund Appropriation. Is Zalita here? Okay, we'll come back to her um, if she uh, she makes it back. Uh, and a reminder, um, although she wasn't speaking uh, on this uh, if directly, uh, we do have a public hearing on the McIntyre uh, after a public comment. So if you have not signed up for that, uh, please feel, feel free to, to speak in that. Next up is uh, Nancy um, Gentile. I can't quite make that out. That's Gentile, yes. Gentile, Nancy Gentile. Hi, my name is Nancy Gentile, and I live at uh, 20 Islington Street. Hello. <laughs> um, well, I was here to ask um, about the parking. <laughs> I know it's a it's a big thing, um, and I live. Well, like I said, I live at 20 Islington Street, and I have to worry about where I'm going to park before I go home at night. And, um, you know, it's getting pretty, pretty ridiculous. <laughs> so I was wondering if anything's going to be done about it. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next up, uh, Peter Whalen on the topic of the settlement. Good evening, uh, Mayor McEachran, members of the City Council, City Manager. As you know, there was a uh, hearing this morning at, uh, at Brentwood uh, Superior Court. Um, in the settlement agreement, there is a clause in here that says under number seven, representations and warranties of the city. The city hereby represents and warrants to the best of its knowledge. And then under C, it says there's no action, suit, or proceeding at law or in equity or official investigations before any court or government authority. So I would urge you tonight, based on the citizens that are our plaintiffs against the city with a McIntyre, um, you're, you're in violation of your settlement agreement because there is a suit pending. So what I would recommend to the city council is tonight you table your motion to expend funds to pay off Sobo Square and await the court's decision uh, moving forward. And it looks like the court will probably grant a hearing. It'll be very quick, probably in the next couple weeks, and we should be able to move this forward. But in the settlement agreement, it states that the city should not have any pending lawsuits considering on the McIntyre property, and you have one right now. So I think moving forward, I think the prudent measure for all members of the city council would be to table the motion to expend any funds and pay so both squared until that's uh, settled. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, next up, we have Mark Brighton, the topic of elections. <clears throat> Mark Brighton, South Mill Street. This past city election was unquestionably the most corrupt since uh, Cappy Stewart and Marshall, as in police chief Entwistle, ran the brothels and the city politics at the turn of the 20th century. We no longer sell the favors of women on the streets of Portsmouth. We are literally selling the streets of Portsmouth and typically to the lowest common denominator. Each of you signed candidate's ethics statement, basically a civility pledge. The last week or two of the past election were anything but civil. Now, I don't have to enumerate what these incivilities were because we all know what they were. I mean, it's not a mystery to anyone up there. Not a single one of you said anything while this was going on, and not one of you said a single thing 
uh, after the election. Now, you cannot wash your hands of this like me, like Lady Macbeth, out, out, damn spot. The perpetrators of this electoral travesty represented you, each one of you. That's how you got elected. Ms. Cook, you are the ethics, self-proclaimed ethics expert of the city, of the city council anyway. What say you? Silence can be as unethical as the action itself. Thank you, Mark. Uh, next up, we have Esther Kennedy, uh, topic of diversity. Uh, first, Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that it's a teacher appreciation week. Um, that didn't get on the agenda. I'm kind of sad. Uh, but uh, it's a big week, so thank your teachers out there. Um, I noticed on the agenda that Councillor Cook and Assistant Mayor Kelly have under their name um, to develop a community conversation relating to diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And I would ask that you include a Ms. Zalita Morgan to that committee to support you in that. For those of you who don't know, Ms. Salita Morgan, who does come here periodically and speak, was the first woman we had on council that was an immigrant. The first woman, that her first language was not English. She was a woman that had brought a lot of integrity to the council, a lot of good ideas, a lot of good information. She has real inspiration for our community and coming to the community with a very different perspective. I had the privilege of working with Ms. Morgan quite intensely during my two years on council during that time. She would come most Sundays and we go through the agenda. And I really feel that sometimes we got, she's been forgotten. As someone that broke out there um, as you know, there's very few women on council usually, but she broke out as a woman from diversity. So I would ask that you include her on the committee. Um, I don't know if she'll accept, she doesn't know I'm speaking tonight, but I would hope that you would do that. And lastly, I would also ask that we include someone with disabilities, preferably someone that has to be in a wheelchair trying to get around our city. As my time on council, I would spend a lot of time talking about that. For those of you who don't know, I have spent 35 years working with individuals with disabilities. Um, the last 25 is Director of Student Service for Individuals with Disabilities. And I would encourage you to add those people to, the com to your committee. They do not, they get forgotten and have over the years. So as we talk about equity, inclusion, and justice, I would ask that you include those, uh, Ms. Salita Morgan, who was definitely the first person of diversity on our city council, and someone from the disabilities rights community. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Next up, Petra Huda on the budget. Good evening, Mayor McGeckern, City Council. Petra Huda, 280 South Street. Um, this is addressed to council as well as the taxpayers. Uh, in reviewing the agenda for tonight, um, I'm not gonna address the uh, first resolution that you have on here to spend $900,000. I'm gonna do a little review of when our fiscal year begins and ends. So the fiscal year budget is developed on a 12 month cycle. June for, July 1st to June 30th. We are in FY22 right now. FY22 ends at June, 20, June 30th, 22. FY23 begins on July 1st and goes through June 2023. Since the budget should be available to us pretty soon as residents, 
Um, I'd like to call your attention to page two of the agenda where you say you are appropriating on or before July 15th, 2022, which is FY23, an amount of a million dollars on the McIntyre. So my question is, how can the city council put a supplemental appropriation in for a budget that the taxpayers haven't seen and you haven't approved? Moving on. The next appropriation that you have in here is for another 500,000 on or before July 15th, 2023, which is an election year. Next question, how can you appropriate to a future budget of an unknown council? So I would ask, is the council confused? Or is this one of those moving forward without looking at the dates? So show me as a taxpayer how you can burden the taxpayers in the next two years and a council that you, we don't even know who will exist and who's going to be on it with, the, with this responsibility and put the transparency for the budgets in this where it belongs. This was your decision. It should be in your budgets. Thank you. Thank you, Petra. Uh, I see, did Zalita come in? Oh, there you are. Okay. Zalita. Uh, can I, can I still come in? Yep, your topics of governance committee and fund appropriation. Yes, thank you for allowing me to speak. Sorry I'm late. Uh, Zalita Morgan, Richards Avenue. Uh, thanks, counselors, for being here, for your service, and for everything that you lead. Um, I want to speak about the Governance Committee. Um, I would like to request that this committee thinks of itself as a bottom-up committee. The meetings are taking place at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. Governance is something that's very important to all of us. It's about who governs and how we are governed. And that implies that should automatically request that the people, the voters, are engaged in the conversations. And just for clarification, I have absolutely, at this point, no comments, uh, specific comments on the agenda broad, but it's clear that there was already a, a thought behind, fine. But when you have the agenda, you are the committee and you are guiding. I mean, there is absolutely no room for a third party, independent party, to really lead conversation on the topics you think should be discussed. And likewise, to bring to you topics that we, residents and voters, believe should be considered. So what started as council rules has evolved into a very, very drastic, you know, of charter amendments and, and this, 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 and that. I mean, if, we, if you're really serious about listening to the bottom up, if you're really serious about a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, you can't be this disconnected. At a 10 o'clock in the morning, the very first meeting that, that I, was, I had a chance to attend, there, were only, there wasn't even quorum from the committee, and the meeting went on. There were just a couple of people attending the meeting. And the last meeting I attended, there were several mayors. I think, I, you know, I think it was a very interesting approach to invite uh, previous mayors to speak on a topic of mayor uh, election and all this stuff. But we were behind this committee. There were people behind. There was nothing on the agenda indicating that this forum was going to be there. And at the end, the voters present had 10 minutes or less to really speak or share their opinions. So I really would plea with you to really consider the time of these civic meetings. And I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to.
quote um, our former Supreme Court Justice um, Souter. He, on the speech, he, he, he said, democracy cannot withstand ignorance, civic ignorance. So you have an opportunity to really instill and bring civic knowledge, civic engagement, but that only happens from the bottom up. So thank you so much. Sorry that I, I took a little bit more of the time. Thank you. Thank you, Zalita. Next up is Paige Trace on the topic of Portsmouth. Thank you, Mayor McEachern. Paige Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Of the people, by the people, for the people. You are all of the people. You were all elected by the people. And you all work for the people. Let's talk about respect in the government's con governance committee meeting this past week. I'm not going to go into the meeting itself. I think it's been hashed over plenty. Um, I do applaud Councillor Denton for bringing up what he did. Um, I think you behaved admirably, and I think you did the best you could for the people who elected you that you work for. Councillor Cook, of the people, by the people, for the people, you had your back to the very people that you work for the entire meeting. That is not respectful of the very people who put you in office that you work for. So I respectfully say maybe you might want to consider not having your back to the very people that you are supposedly trying to help during a meeting. Respect. All of you have jobs. We all had jobs. Um, I find it staggering that not one counselor was at the meeting for the people that live in the Sagamore Creek area when they were told that they needed to have a discussion about possibly paying an average of $16,000 a household. Where were all of you? We all had jobs. We all still do. But many of us were at that meeting because it's about caring about good government, it's about caring about Portsmouth, and it's about caring about the person who doesn't necessarily live in your neighborhood. Respect. Where were any of you this morning? Many of us showed up. We had nothing to say. We aren't plaintiffs. But we showed up because it is a huge big deal. As the city attorney said, it's a very, very complicated situation that is going to require a very, very careful dance. And yet none of you showed up to care to learn. So I thank you for your time. It is about respect, and I respectfully say I wish you all the best with your decisions. But think wisely, please, about what ex-Counselor Whalen said. Thank you. Thank you, Paige. Uh, next up, Bill Downey on the topic of the McIntyre. Uh, good evening, Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. As you know, today was quite a day. Uh, so many ways to start, but I'll just jump in. On return, I went to the post office. I received two checks from people I haven't seen in months thanking me for our efforts. Two attorneys in the last 72 hours offered their services. I've been involved with a lot of nonprofits in my day and good causes. I have never seen the kind of response I experienced. Quite honestly, now that we have legal representation, I feel like I've got both wings flying for, for once in a year and a half. 
And I have to say that, Mr. Sullivan, you, you and I go back a long ways. I remember the softball game and you knocked me on my can once in a game. And uh, I hit you back and we had a beer and we've known each other ever since. So this is not personal, this is professional. I've said many times, this propagated, fictional narrative that we are somehow susceptible to tens of millions of dollars is just that, it's fiction. It with no disrespect to the Ukrainian people, it has about as much credibility as denazifying or the country. It's that egregious. If there was a problem, if there was a disentanglement that wasn't proper, which was Redgate Kane that was in bad faith. Mr. Tabor, you know for, the, for firsthand that interim agreement basically said it was going to play nice. They acted out, they were petulant, there was name calling. Now, Mr. Whalen knows I wasn't very happy with him for eight months because I'm calling it down the middle, balls and strikes. It's not about ideology, it's about pragmatism. Now, that interim agreement said they were going to play nice, there'd be a little bit of money, but ever since that, I feel they lost control and they acted out petulantly. That was bad faith. So the fact that we're here engaged with bad faith citizens obviously upsets me. I think the narrative is a disservice because we cannot find solutions to our problems with disinformation. The one thing that probably upsets me more than anything is we've been deprived of a kumbaya moment. We should be enhanced by this experience, not div seeing division and discord. But again, I think we need the right information. The judge will sign here pretty soon. But I ask all of you to consider, where is Mr. Conley, the high-powered attorney? He's a specialist. City attorneys are swift army knives. But that's a question you all need to ask yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill. Next up, uh, Peter Somsich on the topic of McIntyre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the State Council. I am uh, State Representative Peter Somsich of 34 Sweat Avenue, and I come to comment on your current proposal regarding the agreement between the City and Redgate Kane. While I'm reserving final judgment at the, of the merits of this agreement with Redgate Kane at this time, I do this because I am not satisfied that I have received enough of the details of your agreement. So I'm here both to voice my concerns, but also to learn more about the details of your agreement with Redgate Kane. Before I present my concerns, allow me to confess that as a good friend of Paul McEachran's, I greatly respect his legal opinion regarding the previous agreement with Redgate Kane, which stated simply said, we have no legally binding agreement with them, and either party could walk away from the initial agreement without incurring any penalty. But here are the concerns that I have at this time, and I hope you will address them. How is it possible for the City of Portsmouth to have committed themselves to an agreement with a developer for initial designs and quotes for a piece of property that we have not owned and may never own? Two, how is it possible for the City to not only pay at least $2 million for designs that were produced at the time that we did not own any of this property? How can a developer threaten us with a lawsuit regarding possible profits that it would make over the next 20 years, again, for a property the city does not even own? Four, while, while I understand the city's eagerness to get rid of the lawsuit filed by Redgate Kane for a staggering amount of $2 million, I do not understand why that agreement came with additional conditions wedding us to Redgate Kane and future expenses to be incurred without a bottom line for the total expenses that the city's taxpayers will have to bear. And finally, is it not apparent that this settlement could be seen as the city of Portsmouth raising a white flag to a developer and thereby encouraging other developers to, to use the very same tactics in the future? Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sonson. As I've stated before, uh, clapping certainly when we're celebrating uh, something unanimously happy, um, but clapping is not 
uh, welcome in this chamber uh, when it's one side against the other. I'd ask that you respect the chamber uh, and uh, the council and the citizens of Portsmouth by withholding applause uh, when it's obviously a, a, uh, a more delicate um, discourse that's going on. Next up and final speaker uh, here is Councillor or Rick Beckstead. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, Rick Beckstead, 1395 Visiting Street. Uh, I was here two weeks ago looking and hoping that we would be doing something about the um, demolition committee and bringing that forward. That's not an opinion, that's not a blue ribbon, uh, it has nothing to do with the mayor itself. Any councillor can go and bring forward. On April 29th of 2021, the committee had made recommendations and sat down, and again, Councilman Monroe was there. They made those recommendations and it went stale. Um, we now have three projects that are going to be up for demo uh, in the city, and it was basically the uh, views of that committee that we needed to stop and slow down. Uh, Council Lombardi, just down the road from you, is where we ended up moving uh, in this forward direction to be able to make those changes as a committee to empower them a little bit more to slow down this type of development because it changes ultimately the character of a neighborhood. And the house that was put in there on Alder Street definitely altered. And the neighbors were not able to go and weigh in when they wanted to and the ability. That's what this committee that was done by Chris Dwyer, Councillor Denton served under Councillor Dwyer when this committee happened. You know, I, I, I don't want to make any judgment calls or anything, but a lot of things seem to be happening because we don't like people. I have come under the impression that because myself comes forward and my name is attached to something, it is completely disregarded by people, maybe of this council, maybe people in this community. But it seems to be happening more and more. I'll be challenging on Thursday the parking traffic and safety because my street that I live on is going to be used as a study and because I live on it just down the road from where they want to end the study will not continue on a road that should be lowered from 30 to 25 from one end to the other. This is how I'm feeling ignored. This is the third time I've now addressed this council and I am aggravated and I am upset. Please do your job. This is not about me. This is about everyone in this community. Three people are knocking down buildings. This will alter, ultimately, the character, the heritage, the history of a town that is about to ready to celebrate 400 years next year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rick. Next, no speakers online. We'll end the public comment and it waited a motion. Uh Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules to bring forward um, item 13B, presentation of Portsmouth 400 celebration. Second. And we will, oh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Would Dari and uh, Susan please come up? The floor is yours. Good evening, thank you very much for moving us up on the agenda, we appreciate that. Um, Mayor McEachern and Assistant Mayor Kelly and Councilors, City Manager and Staff, thank you very much for your time this evening. We want to tell you about the Portsmouth NH400. My name is Valerie Roshan and I'm the Managing Director of the nonprofit organization Portsmouth NH400 Inc. Susan Labrie is our Community Engagement Officer. And Thank you very much, City Manager, for running the slides for us. Can we go to slide two, please? We would like to uh, thank you for the opportunity. We, we have some really exciting plans for 2023 for celebrating the 400th anniversary of the settlement of Portsmouth. We have, and many members of our community have, plans underway to celebrate throughout 2023. Next slide, please. What are we celebrating? Well, first, I'd like to just emphasize that this is a celebration by the people for the people. 
We are one of the first communities in, Amer in North America, to, well, in the United States, <laughs> to celebrate 400 years. And being New Hampshire's only seaport, we are the entry point for New Hampshire settlement. That's a lot of history there. And Portsmouth is a historically visual city where you can walk around and experience what it was like hundreds of years ago in buildings that are being used for restaurants and shops, housing and businesses. We knew many years ago the importance of preserving our historical character and charm. We are celebrating Portsmouth spirit, shining the light on who we have been as a people 400 years ago recognizing and honoring the indigenous people who settled there here previously. We are celebrating who we are today, how we got here, and where we're going tomorrow. Our goal is to bring community together by providing opportunities to tell our stories through programs, events, exhibits, and legacy programs. Next slide. Portsmouth 400th anniversary is about to happen. There's no stopping it. There will be opportunities to become in, engaged, educated, and hopefully inspired to become involved through a variety of programs and events that are both accessible and affordable and family friendly. It is about community and finding a relevance and meaning through shared history. This city reeks of stories, some good, some bad, some ugly, some just plain hysterical. We want these stories to be shared, to be an inspiration for continued investment in the city. And we want the next year to be infused with fun. Because the spirit of Portsmouth is one of ultimate parties. We are resilient, we celebrate. In fact, we've held parades for individual people in the past. And we are hospitable. We are the city of the open door. And we want people to learn about history while having fun. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what are we about as Portsmouth and H400 Inc.? These are our values. Diversity, inclusion, respect, and accessibility. Seeking historical accuracy, and that means perspectives. There's facts, and there's facts from one side, and there's facts from another side. So it's about perspectives and seeking historical accuracy. Community pride through education and engagement sustainability, and as we've said a couple of times, fun. We want everybody involved. We want this to be fun. We want this to be a real celebration. Next slide, please. We've identified seven themes or pillars, and we're going to go through some of them and just talk about why we think that these are important as we start to develop our programs, projects, and events for 2023. History permeates across all of these pillars, so you'll not see one that's specific to history. Arts and culture is, is one, of our, one of our teams, and what we've done is we've gone out to our leadership organizations. We have so much rich, so many rich organizations that, you know, the Music Hall, Prescott Park Arts Festival, PMAC, all of these organizations that already do something brilliant. We're not asking them to do something different. We're asking them to do something brilliant that applies to the 400th. So these organizations are coming back with some great ideas. Strawberry Bank Museum is going to do an indigenous people festival and the story of the Dawnland, trying to be inclusive. There were many, many, many people here before we were in 1623. So um, let's, let's include the indigenous population. The Portsmouth Symphony Orchestra and, and the Music Hall are working on a new production that I think will be performed. Right now we're thinking it's going to be performed in June of 2023, the first time it will ever be performed. Juneteenth, um, Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, Jerry Ann and gang, fabulous. They're planning a four-day reggae, jazz, spiritual gospel festival to really celebrate that diversity and that inclusion. And history through art, Ruth Blay, well, they're talking about launching four more of those uh, murals during the entire year. So it's not just one week, it's not just one month, it is throughout the entire year that we're looking to celebrate. Next slide, slide, please. Commerce and trade. We know that Portsmouth was not founded on religion. It was founded on trade. It was founded by the fishermen um, in, and quickly grew into the, the number one beer um, company in the entire country. So what does that say about us? Now with 15 microbreweries right here in town, beer will play an important role <laughs> under the commerce and trade pillar. 
Um, we will have a PNH 400 beer. Um, I think I, I already know we're going to have multiple beer fests, um, and those will be part of some of the other programs, projects, and events that we're, that we're planning as well. Um, <clears throat> we're also going to do a summer, try, again, trying to include local artists and local folks. We'll do a summer scavenger hunt for pieces that have been created by local artists um, and in conjunction with the retail community. Next slide, please. Community and neighborhoods. This is just such a critical part of what we're trying to do is to bring everybody, all the community together. So one of the things that we're planning, one of our teams, the community and neighborhoods team, is planning a Little Italy carnival that will hopefully be a one-day event, community-focused, family fun, to rival a day in, in uh, Boston's North End, honoring the Italian community that was moved in the 60s and 70s. Uh, <clears throat> there'll be a masquerade ball as a fundraiser. So again, fun, we're trying to instill fun in here. We're gonna have a lantern festival celebrating the kindness of the people of the city of the open door. <clears throat> the Westival, again, an organization very rich in, in what they brought to the city, is going to be focusing on the English and the Irish communities, the English and Irish immigrants. Trying to get a friend of mine over who sings, uh, who's from Dublin and sings uh, leads uh, sing-alongs. And of course the BIPOC festival, uh, Black Indigenous People of Color festival, in, in uh, hopefully in the fall of 2023. Next slide, please. Education, critically important. The education team is spearheaded by two sophomores at Portsmouth High School. We want to include the entire school system. They're focused on three issues. One is oral histories. We have close to 60 people that we want to interview on video. We want to, tell, we want to hear their stories. Susan talked about the stories, the good, the bad, the ugly, and the hysterical. <laughs> um, we want to hear about all of them, and we want to archive them. The Portsmouth Public Library will be archiving them for us. Uh, we're gonna, they're going to develop a website to share those stories and others of historical significance, and they're also going to create a Portsmouth history curriculum at the, uh, at the high school. Uh, and these are all, this is all being led by two sophomores, one of whom, by the way, is the uh, secretary of our corporation. Um, Dennis Robinson is also going to be doing a comic book about the history of Portsmouth that will, that will appeal to the middle and high school students. So, <clears throat> trying to get everybody in there. Next one. Military and maritime. How can you possibly talk about Portsmouth and the Portsmouth area without paying homage to the waterways? Um, we're going to have two boat parades. And we've already uh, reserved that little boat right there with the water thing, the water cannon thing. Um, <laughs> One is, is uh, in conjunction with our, we are going to be doing a parade, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, as part of that parade and the River Fest, we're collaborating with the River Fest to, uh, we will have a, the, the downtown parade, we'll have the boat parade, we'll be working with Prescott Park to have, Prescott Park Arts Festival to have um, a concert, and, the, and we will walk, literally the parade will walk right through River Fest um, on, uh, on Marcy Street. So very excited about collaborating with them. Then there's also the Tall Ships, and we're really going to beef up the, uh, the boat parade during the Tall Ships Festival. We don't have a date on that yet, but they're working to get as many Tall Ships as we can coming here. Again, it's people who do already do something really well, asking them to do something that's really specific to the 400th. Um, we're working to get some very special ships in at, uh, for one of, those parade, one of those boat parades as well. Keeping History Above Water is, water is a national symposium. And Stephanie Secord has been instrumental in getting that landed here from May 2023, talking about the rising tides, obviously, and climate change. And we're also going to be having a water fair. Uh, Kathy Reddington is the, is the team leader for Maritime and Military, and she's talking about putting on a water fair as part of that river fest, talking about all things water um, that, we're, that we're engaged with here in, in Portsmouth. Um, next is signature events. Yes, we have invited Prince Charles. <laughs> Every time we talk about the Portsmouth NH400, somebody says, are you having a parade and is Prince Charles coming? Yes, we've invited him. We're in touch with the Portsmouth UK Lord, Lord Mayor and their city council. We've asked them to invite uh, Prince Charles and the entire royal family. Um, he actually was not here specifically for the, 300, for the 350th. He was here on the HMS Minerva. Everybody thinks he came just for us. We can go with that. That's one of the historical ones. Um, but we, so we've invited him again. He's not going to be here on the HMS Minerva, but you know, who knows? He could show up. So the parade is one thing. 
Uh, that's in June. In August, we're going to have dinner with 700 of our closest friends on Congress Street. Very excited about that from Market Square all the way down to Jumpin' Jays on the street, white linen tablecloths, and we've got some amazing entertainment planned, which I'm not going to share with you. <laughs> and then in the fall, we are actually talking and working with the Air National Guard for another air show. That will be announced later in June. And one more slide there, if we could, please. Legacy projects. What, what are we going to leave? After, for, after our 400 years. What gifts will we give to the community as a legacy of our first 400 years? Now, the first thing that we're talking about is launching in Bohenko Gateway Park a sculpture garden. So right now we are preparing an RFP to go out to local artists to find out what it is that they would do with a maritime theme. We want to, again, diversion diversion, diversity, inclusion. Um, we want it, the sculptures to be interactive, sort of like you, ne you have never gone to the Boston Public Garden and with a child and not taken a picture on one of those ducks, right? Interactive. You want, we want these to be interactive. We want them to be educational, very similar to the African burying ground. All right, look at this calendar. It's showing some amazing events up there that Valerie's already spoken about, and it's not even up to date. There's still more to come. People continue to be inspired and want to contribute different programs to that are meaningful and relevant to all of, all of us. We love the involvement and the collaboration that we're seeing. Next. Well, how are we going to fund all this? Well, this is an inclusive celebration, and we want to include and involve everyone to contribute and participate at a level that is comfortable to them. We all enjoy the benefits from the depth of the arts, history, and cultural organizations, the variety of restaurants, the retail stores, family-friendly places, coffee shops, beautiful gardens, music, etc. All this stuff feeds our soul and enriches our lives, and it provides a solid foundation for our family. We got started early in 2018 and 2019 and raised some funds that are maintained by the Portsmouth New Hampshire 400 Trust. It's managed by the city and it's dedicated for programs. Well, who else can donate? Well, individuals can donate. And we have a 400 and a 1623 level. So you can see where the 400 and 1623 came from. And if you do that, you not only get swag from Portsmouth, but you also get your name in the historical commemorative book, Leaving Your Family Legacy Behind. Any amount is always appreciated, and we're grateful for all contributions and all donations. We also created business sponsorship levels, starting at $50,000 and going down to $10,000, and program-specific support from 25 to 10, I mean to five. We're also lucky enough to be the beneficiary of the Seacoast Half Marathon this year. And the reason why that's so exciting is that the Seacoast Half Marathon route goes through Portsmouth, Newcastle, and Rye, all of which are turning 400 years old next year. The business community is excited to be part of this effort and are eager to support. They are even contacting us now to find out how they can be involved. There is a genuine interest in providing financial support to all of these programs. We are blessed to have a generous community that values the uniqueness of Portsmouth. So. Quick announcement. You're the first to hear this. Um, we filed for 501c3 status when we incorporated back at, in uh, last year, and there's a 10-month backlog at the IRS. However, working with Senator Shaheen's office, we got news today that we are officially a 501c3 nonprofit organization from the IRS. So um, with many thanks to the Greater Portsmouth Chamber of Commerce Charitable and Education Foundation for offering to ask, act, act as our fiscal agent, we are now our own. So big news tonight. Big news. Mm -hmm. Makes raising money a lot easier, too. So next slide, Karen, please. What's in it for the Portsmouth community? Well, Portsmouth is the incredible city it is today because of the community spirit of the past and present. We encourage people to work together to create civic pride in our history and our achievements. This is an opportunity to make a difference and invest in this community and value our history. Our younger generations will understand the importance of the past and their critical role in the future. Our current locals will work together to create a legacy for our future. We have the ability to make history today, inspiring people 
to become involved in preserving and investing in Portsmouth's future. Next slide. How can you get involved? Well, this is happening in our lifetime. This is amazing, 400 years old. People want to get out. They are ready to be involved. They are ready to be community, part of the community again. So the biggest takeaway of the celebration is there is an opportunity for everyone to be involved, to tell your story, to create something bigger than yourselves, leaving behind a legacy. So volunteer, fundraise, sponsor, donate, attend events, stay informed, run the Seacoast Half Marathon, get to know your neighbor, just get out and be involved and look around at what we have here in this beautiful city. The easiest way to follow us is on Instagram and um, Facebook. Sign up for our newsletter to learn more about the history and the programming and fundraising opportunities um, and volunteer opportunities. Donate. Remember, we need financial support for this to be successful. And we believe success is measured when everyone in the community is involved, having fun, and looking forward with pride and hope. Next. Thank you. Thank you um, to the mayor, assistant mayor, councilors for listening to us, for, for um, considering the budget for us. We're, we're excited about that. Um, and we, we want to give you hot off the press. Christiana created these this afternoon just for you. Well, and for Susan and I, we're wearing them as well. Ask us about PNH 400. We want you involved because you are, it, this is going to happen on your watch. So this is important. This is part of your legacy as well. So we want you as involved as you can be. Join us in whatever way makes you happy. That's our, our motto. Do whatever makes you happy and uh, get involved with us. We'd love to have you join us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please re uh, wear these pins with pride and all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Next up is the uh, public hearing and vote on ordinance and or resolution. Um, <coughs> let's see, a resolution <coughs> authorizing. Your Honor, if I may. Oh, sure. I motion to suspend the rules to bring forward item number 18. City Manager's informational items number one, the McIntyre update. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. City Manager, the floor is yours. Thank you, Your Honor. As shared with the Council late on Friday, uh, we have uh, had a series of conversations with the General Services Administration and the National Park Service in furtherance of our plan to move forward and build the community project as envisioned uh, through the public engagement process. So it's our understanding in talking to the GSA on Friday afternoon that they will work with us to extend the existing license agreement that we currently have, which was uh, set to expire this past, uh, actually yesterday, for an additional eight months so that we can continue to work toward uh, progress in securing the building and the property through the Historic Monument Program. Uh, today, uh, it would be appropriate for the city attorney to give an update on uh, our time in court, which um, I'm sure people want to hear about. Yeah, there was a, a preliminary hearing held today uh, <clears throat> in an action brought by Mr. Downey and, and a number of others against the city, and the primary goal of that action is to seek to have the settlement agreement with uh, Sobo Square or Redgate Cane uh, nullified. Um, no decisions were made in that regard uh, today, but the court did indicate that uh, it will give the matter a, uh, great attention given the significance of the moment. And uh, as I, I believe it was uh, um, former Councilor Whalen said, we anticipate a, a hearing or a decision of some kind on the city's motion to dismiss that case actually within week to 10 days, perhaps. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, thank you, Bob. I will read uh, through now the uh, public hearing. Uh, we will, if there's a presentation, we'll listen to that. 
council questions, then public hearing speakers, obviously, and then more council questions. So, resolution authorizing a supplemental appropriation from fund balance for the settlement agreement between the City of Portsmouth and Sobo Square LLC and costs associated with design and engineering related to the McIntyre property. That the City Council has determined that the sum of $900,000 dollars is to be appropriated from fund balance to defray the expenditures for the settlement agreement between the City of Portsmouth and Sobo Square LLC and costs associated with design and engineering related to the McIntyre property for the fiscal year ending in June 30th, 2022. That the settlement amounts to be made on or before July 15th, 2022, one million dollars and on or before July 15th, 2023, five hundred thousand dollars will be made using future available revenues, which may include fund balance. That to meet this appropriation, the city manager is authorized to transfer these funds from committed fund balance. Your Honor, there is no presentation per se, but I would add that the language in this resolution was developed in consultation with our finance team and our outside financial advisors, along with bond counsel. So I would wait the sample motion, um, <clears throat> and once we have a second on that, we can uh, go to questions. Your Honor, I would move to adopt the proposed supplemental appropriation resolution for the settlement agreement between the city and Sobo Square LLC and costs associated with design and engineering related to the McIntyre property as presented. Second. Okay, any questions? Councillor Denton. Um, former Councillor Whalen brought up waiting on this until after potentially this lawsuit's resolved. And the date I see here is July 15th. Is there an impetus to do this tonight versus waiting? The, well, of course, the city would at all times respect any direction from the courts at any time. Uh, uh, however, at this moment, there has been, has been no direction issued by the court with regard to this. So the, uh, the city council is free to continue moving ahead with the matter unless and until the court should direct otherwise. If I might add to that, the first date uh, at which a payment would be appropriate per the terms of the settlement agreement is May 15th of this year. So this would be the council meeting in advance of that date. One follow-up just on the topic of... Uh, is um, to former Councilor Whalen's uh, point on uh, lit pending litigation. Uh, was it true that to the best of our knowledge that there was no uh, pending litigation uh, when the agreement was executed? Correct. Okay. Councilor Murrow. Um, if we could just get some direction on the authority that we have in which to commit the city to these payments all the way future into 2023, what you know, what gives us the authority to be able to do that? Of course, as the mayor just said, I was not involved in drafting these documents, uh, but when I read them over and looked at them, uh, I thought uh, two things. Uh, number one, uh, a settlement agreement is a contract. And a contract can bind one city council um, and the next city council. So that uh, by signing the settlement agreement, um, the next city council even uh, will be bound by that settlement agreement. Um, and additionally, even though the municipal budget is an annual budget, it has to be repeated annually every year, as, as you certainly know. Um, it has been often been a criticism in the past that uh, advance notice isn't given of budgetary actions or possible future budgetary effects of actions that the council might take. So that it seemed like a good public policy idea, as I read it, to state all these things up front right now so that everyone will know what the settlement agreement terms are going forward because those terms will have to be honored. Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question about the $900,000 figure. I know the settlement agreement states 500000 So that additional 400000 um, do we have an explanation of 
exactly what those charges are? Or the 400,000 um, through the, through your honor, uh, represents what we understand to be our half of design costs associated with seeing the project through to completion of an application with the National Park Service. And the cost would be shared 50-50 with the developer and we would both have to agree to incur those costs before we, we did so. Councilor Moreau. Just a quick follow up on that. So does that mean we'll actually, you, you will be provided with actual invoices or estimates before we actually spend the money? That is correct and we would have to agree to those in advance. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, we will open up to uh, the public hearing. Uh, please just approach name and address. Good evening again, Rick Beck said 1395 Islington Street. I guess I'm a little taken back since I did four years, two as a counselor, two as mayor, where the type of discussion and a motion coming forward before the public hearing actually takes place has never happened before. Um, just wanted to go and point that out. I mean, it's nice to be able to at least get some views on what other counselors are thinking. The only time that you would have any kind of discussion would be if there was a presentation and you had questions that would be with staff or any other consultants or anything like that, not necessarily amongst yourselves. Uh, that usually happens afterwards. And I'm hoping, uh, even though there's a motion now that's on the floor, that you will basically be determining what the public is going to say and whether that happens or not. I mean, Councilor, or sorry, excuse me, uh, Mayor McEachran, uh, you had gone and so stated with people that they was a public hearing so they didn't have to speak on the McIntyre meeting and some people probably spoke as far as that before your motion would come out. So there is amendments that can be made to that motion and have to be voted upon. Uh, but at the same time, I, I would at least ask every counselor and mayor to take that into consideration because you now have a motion that's on the floor before you even heard from the public. So you're going to hear from the public, me now. I served four years, as I said, I lived the McIntyre from day one. And from day one, it was nothing but a surprise. Now, during those two years, we did the best of the ability that we could. Councilor Denton was the only one sitting here today other than uh, the city attorney um, that partook in any of that. And I believe that there was a lot of people and a lot of injustice that was out there and we had an election and here we are. So with that being said, I have to go and give my own opinion on what I stated for, for basically two years. Because when you're mayor and when you're on a council, you're supposed to be respectful. You're respectful to staff. You're respectful to the city manager and others. You have individual conversations that take place, ones that you don't necessarily share with the public. And I'm sure by four months by now, you guys pretty much understand that uh, type of level um, that you try to be respectful to one another and you get things done that way. And when the public is involved, you make your decisions. So. Myself, being the mayor, feel that the majority of the last council was very hesitant from day one when we came in. We were met with defiance. We were met with unruliness. We were treated, as far as I'm concerned, uh, disrespectfully in a lot of ways right from the get-go. And that would be from staff, not having trust. And we thought we were going to have trust. And as those two years went on, that trust went away. Now, I worked personally with the city manager for two years, more than any one of you have gone and done. I have distrust when it comes to the city manager. I have so stated that publicly time and time again. Now, remember, I'm basically a lifer for the most part, the better part of 40 years and growing up here, and Miss Kennard is basically two years, going into her third year. And I have speculated on the relationship that has been building over the two years while I was mayor. And development and developers are some of those ones that I question every single day, including the fact of Michael King. Now, on one of my last meetings on the agenda that we are setting after the election, of course, in December, Ms. Kennard received a phone call. And I said this to the last council from Michael King. Now, how do I know that? Well, the phone that was sitting next to me while we were creating the agenda said Michael King. Now, why would a city manager when we are under litigation, threat of litigation, or actually at that point we are under litigation, have Michael Kane's personal cell phone on her phone and have it named and lit up. I mean, it just, it boggles me with some of the things that have gone and transpired, especially the way you have all 
been led to believe that you're doing the right thing. In my opinion, Michael Caine, Sobo Square, Redgate Caine, whatever you want to call it, is a bully. Now, anyone that ever remembers in high school or any school being in school and being bullied, what do you do? I mean, to this day and age, you probably would go and get in trouble if you stood up to that bully. I was bullied. I was bullied here in Portsmouth. I spent two years in California. I spent six years in the Lakes region area, and every single one of them, I was met with bullies. But I stood up to bullies. And I believe the city of Portsmouth wants to stand up to a bully, a bully that has sued the city three times. Three times. You lost all three times. Attorney Sullivan can tell you that that was done. Three times. And in a stipulation under the original agreement, which I believe that this new agreement will override, so stated that any partner that is chosen will not be able to enter into a partnership agreement if you sued the city. And at least, what, Bob, two out of the three met within the criteria. I mean, it, and it did. But there was a technicality that was given by Nancy Colbert Puff. It was never done at our counselor, Councilor Denton. It was never brought to our attention. They gave him a pass because the two lawsuits that were brought against him were under Borthwick Avenue. It wasn't really Michael Caine, and it wasn't Sobo Square, and when is Redgate Caine? So it's a name technicality. I still think to this day, and I will go and give to the court hearings that are coming forward, if Friday is the date, Bob, that they should be using that as a stipulation that we never should have been involved with Michael Caine in the first place, ever. It was, it, that should have been a judgment called by the council, Councilor Denton. That should never have been had, left, left, left up to an executive level or a city manager, not Karen Kennard. And that was the illustrious John Bohinko. Trust. It's earned. I served under two city managers. I didn't really trust that one. He was a little more respectful. That thing that I had said the other, the, uh, at the other public hearing and everything as far as distrust and feeling that everything is against me comes from your now city manager. I get greeted with mayor. I am never looked at. I am never talked to. She's looking down at me right now and not looking me at the podium, podium at all. She's lived here two years. I've lived here my whole life. I'm telling you right now, start questioning the city manager. She's not telling you the truth. Thank you. Planning board member Mahana. Actually, resident Greg Mahana. Thank you. Aviation Avenue. In my professional life, I've spent 27 years as the president of a family office for the former founder of the largest employer in the state of New Hampshire. I'm a commercial pilot, I'm a general contractor, a developer, and a landlord. I'm fluent in contract law. The proposed payment to Redgate Kane is simply the most egregious attempt to sweep the most simple tenets of contract law under the rug. Right, Attorney Sullivan? The development agreement, which is key to this entire discussion, amounted to nothing more than a letter of intent, whereby two parties would attempt to create a plan to develop McIntyre that met both the city approval and approval of the National Park Service. Fast forward. The residents, the council, and the National Park Service rejected the Redgate Cane plan. Rejected. Normally, at this point, the plan would change or both parties would part ways. Also, at this point, a claim for liquidated damages or specific damages would be made. Instead, Redgate Kane played legal games with the city for two entire years. Now here we are, considering a council vote to spend $2 million to appease Redgate Kane for yet to be itemized expenditures. This developer that was formerly suing the city, but yet incredulously remains the city's partner, a partner in a second project yet to be approved by the National Park Service. Why are we even here to listen to the vote on this expense? Where's the transparency? I understand that the development agreement may be confidential, but please substantiate the $2 million by showing the public exactly what these expenses actually are. Explain 
the actual itemized line items exactly as every single city department is required to do. How can you possibly make payment prior to the current litigation being settled? Counselors, I have not heard a single supporter this evening for this proposal to spend $2 million to appease Redgate King. Counselors, the elections are in 18 months. Thank you. Bill Downey, 67 Bow Street. I believe if I heard you correctly, Mr. Sullivan, you had told the judge today that there actually is a pending case. I would ask Mr. Sullivan to answer that as appropriate mayor in the right time. I've learned a lot. One thing I learned more recently is this false assessment or argument that we're somehow beholden to them is fictitious. In order to have a binding contract here, there has to be an agreement from the National Parks and the GSA. Then it becomes binding. Until then, it's not. And that's the falsehood. So I ask you to do your due diligence respectfully. We just heard a conflict between the city manager and what the city attorney said in court today. That needs to be settled. Thank you. So, some of us went today. Name and, and address, please. Why is it always me? Petra Huda, 280 South Street. I attended the meeting this morning, and I learned a lot. First thing I learned was the suit is still there. It has not been settled. That was told to us by our city attorney. The next thing I learned and that I would really like to pursue here is in his, in his haste to put out there that this is so complex and this is so expensive to the citizens of Portsmouth, the city attorney gave us a number of 60 million that was coming forward from this developer. Now, as a taxpayer, I'm very concerned. I'm also very concerned that it was coming out in a trial when he was putting this up and it did not come from the council. The other thing we learned and this morning that could have been said, that wasn't said, is that the GSA has now approved us to go forward. So the question is, if that, if that roadblock was removed on Friday and Mr. Kane was made aware of that, why isn't there anything on the docket for him to remove his lawsuit? As you, Councilor McGeckern, and Councillor Tabor had experienced two years of this person telling us that we were going to drop the lawsuit, we're doing this, and then turning around and going absolutely the other way. I'm a taxpayer now. This is going to be on my bill. So I would really like some transparency from this council on <coughs> what you actually know and what's coming out, of, out at a hearing that none of you attended. Was this done in another meeting that the taxpayers were unaware of? The other thing I'd like to address is the, Bob, I don't know what else to call it, but that the Sullivan twist on what your response was to Councillor Moreau. The budget cycles are 12 months. Setting a precedent and telling people what is coming is total crap, Bob. And that's all I got to say. Larry Booz, 172 Northwest Street here in Portsmouth. I've been a longtime resident and I've been a taxpayer and that's why I'm here. This morning I attended the hearing down in Rockingham County and 
One of the reasons I attended was I had also had a copy of the city's response to the plaintiff's motion. And I was shocked to see that uh, with counsel's consent that the city attorney would put in writing to say something to the effect under letter A, the plaintiffs misunderstand the potential appropriation of funds by the city does not cause the actual expenditure of any funds. And then back under item E, plaintiffs are not parties to the settlement agreement and therefore lack standing to litigate its terms. Definition of legal standing means that can you be physically or monetarily injured in a course of action? If you can be legally or monetarily injured, you have legal standing. By that definition, all of us taxpayers, we have legal standing. These people were elected by us. They have a fiduciary responsibility to listen to each and every one of you, not just me, each and every one in the city. And that has not been the case. So these two statements in your motion, Attorney Sullivan, brought to my mind, do you really think that the city of Portsmouth, that the citizens are naive enough to think that if you allocate this money, you're not going to spend it? Because that's what you put in your motion. And secondly, to think that we don't have legal standing when we're the taxpayers, we put you people here in your positions. Kane's tactic all along has been to use the threat of litigation to affect a settlement agreement. He not only used it to affect the settlement agreement, he also used it to try to swing an election. Now that's an open debate and that's another story. I'm not going to get into that tonight. But under the uh, model code for legal conduct, and I'm sure you're aware of this, Attorney Sullivan, and I'm quoting, discourages using the threat of litigation to gain advantage in negotiations. Kane has clearly done this because you guys raised the white flag, as another speaker said. You've capitulated. You don't even know if he would have won the case, let alone won $2.4 million. But you're giving it to him. And it's not your money. It's our money. It's our tax revenues. It's the tax revenues of me, a married homeowner. It's the tax revenues of every single parent mom and every single parent dad. It's the tax revenues of every waiter and waitress struggling to make a living in this city. You worry about low-income housing. Worry about the money you're giving away. Under the terms of this settlement, you said Kane is going to receive $2.4 million, and he's guaranteed, according to the language, a 7.4% rate of return. And he may charge fees that are, quote, normal and customary. Now, nobody's brought this subject up. I'm going to bring it up. What does $2.4 million mean to you and mean to you? Last year's city budget was $123 million. Let's do the math. $2.4 million is 2% of that $123 million. Now, I know, Manager Conrad, you've probably done the math. But the average person in Portsmouth has not. Now, subsequent to the idea of the settlement, the city has announced a statistical tax increase, a tax increase for you and you and you and all of you. Where is that 2% that's going to Cain coming from? It's coming from the statistical tax increase. So whether it's funds that are there or funds that are being appropriated, that money is going to be made up somewhere. And it's going to be made up on the backs of not just me, but it's going to be made up on all of your backs. And that's the crime in this settlement. Most businesses 
have a profit margin of a few percent. I was an airline captain for 34 years. I was served in the military before that. Airlines run about a 2 or 3 percent profit margin. You're giving Kane a guaranteed 7.4 percent profit margin, and then you're giving him a $2.4 million gift. In what world does this make any sense? Uh, usually when there's multiple bidders on a project, everybody comes up with a design. Uh, not all the designs are awarded. One's awarded. The other people have expended money, and they haven't been compensated for their designs. You've entered into agreement where you want to compensate him for his design, or compensate him, better yet, for his bad design first time around. So I'm left with this. What's Portsmouth's biggest problem? It's not lack of talent. It's not lack of education. It's not even lack of money. It's a spending problem. And as bad as a spending problem is, whether we build one more brick sidewalk, should we be giving somebody $2.4 million for doing nothing? Because nobody here has had the ability to sit down and negotiate in good faith. And Mayor Beckstead was correct. How do you deal with a bully? Do you roll over and play dead? Excuse me, can you address the council? I, w I am. Okay. Do you roll over and play dead? Or do you meet him head on? Now, as you can tell from what I've said, I think you're basically giving the eye an outright gift. But I'm going to make one more point in terms of reality. Everybody talks about the high rental fees in Portsmouth. Well, the high rental fees are passed on generally by landlords who are paying exorbitantly high taxes. My tax bill is over $16,000. And I am a landlord in addition to other things. So I do pass some of that on. But these rental fees and these high taxes are a disproportionate burden that each of us pay because of bad decisions, uncontrolled spending. But what burden is the developer bearing? What burden is Kane bearing? You're giving him a gift. And Again, I'm not naive. I know how this vote's going to go. There's not a doubt in my mind. There's not a doubt in their minds either. But there will be another election. And I think it's safe to say a lot of people will be voting differently. Thank you for your time. The only other thing I would add, uh, there's going to be a hearing in Rockingham County do you really want to step on your toes and appropriate money tonight? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Roy, podium's yours. What is with the hands? So embarrassing. Roy Hall, 777 Middle Road. What I'd like to ask is, they're asking for $2 million, two-some million dollars for design and engineering. Well, the last city council, you know, this Mayor, you hired an organization to come and make a design for us to give us more green area. That was fifty to seventy-five thousand dollars only. Why are they suing for two million dollars? Or why are you going to agree to give two million dollars to do the same job? And they did nothing except a drawing and an engineering study. So did the other core organization that you guys hired. <clears throat> Same thing. So why is theirs so much higher than the other one? Is the other one worse? They gave us more than we wanted than the Redgate did and came. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Next speaker. Good evening, members of the council. Page Trace, 27 Hancock Street. Like others who attended the court meeting this morning in Rockingham County Court, we heard a lot of things that didn't quite 
necessarily add up. Now, I don't need to tell any of you, but I probably do need to tell the public that in full disclosure, I sat on the subcommittee with the chairman, Councilor Whalen, the current mayor, Deglin McEachran, and city councilor, John Tabor. So the four of us are probably in a unique position and as much as you all as a new council might think that you know everything, there's probably some stuff that we know a little more intimately that time brings. One of the things I do know is that before I was sworn in as a city councilor, I received a phone call at home from Nancy Colbert Puff trying to get me to explain to her how I felt about McIntyre, not that I was even a city councilor yet. And then she tried to get me to change my mind about McIntyre, as if I had formally formulated an opinion. And she was very, very concerned that I walk into this room once I was sworn in as a counselor and it's like vote one way, my way or the highway. And I took exception to that. And I said, no, I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm not sworn in yet. And furthermore, should you really be calling me when I haven't even been sworn in? So be it. I would also suggest to you that tonight, like everyone else, like the gentleman um, before Mr. Hazel, so eloquently stated, it's, it's a very sad thing, but due to your consistency, unbelievable, amazing consistency in your nine zero votes, night after night after night, it leaves most of us with very little question of how this is going to go. Of course, we do hope that you will have respect for your position and that you will have respect as an individual to vote in the best manner that you think possible because respectfully to all of you, your vote will be a representation of you personally as a city councilor. Not what Attorney Sullivan told you you should do because you asked him how you should vote. You are a city councilor. You were elected by a body. I am thrilled that you are all up there. I don't want any one of your chairs, frankly, honestly. But I do expect you, now that I'm just a taxpayer, I expect you to act in the best interests of every taxpayer out there. And I expect you to respect the taxpayers who put you there. Now, there was a development agreement back in the good old days and there was a draft form of the ground lease. I don't need to go into all this because I'm sure that Attorney Sullivan and City Manager Kennard have filled you in more than sufficiently. The fact of the matter is that the current agreement that was just put as part of your special meeting that you have now the signatures of the developers and as I understand it, the city manager had no outs. Councilor Moreau, I'm, I'm shocked because you're a brilliant woman and you're a land use attorney. And at least the last development agreement was sort of an intent for everybody to do their thing with plenty of outs, 2.1.8, um, among other numerous eight, 7.6 and 8.1, I believe, within that development agreement. 
but they were ways for either party to leave the party, the dance, if it wasn't going to work out. Now you have this development agreement, and Attorney Sullivan, you said you are the senior legal counsel for this city, and yet you admitted tonight that you didn't write that. So I say, who did write it? And why are the residents of this city not hearing who wrote that? Because that contract that you all just entered into doesn't have a single out for the city if it goes wrong. If you suddenly find yourself in a situation where the developers say, okay, 60 grand, 60 million, whatever it is, the number, and you say, uh, no. And they say, see you in court. Because you don't have an out. At least the old development agreement had an out. And you're willingly signing on the dotted line and giving a gift of our taxpayers' money of $2.4 million to a developer and signing it away, and you have no out, no escape route. No, nothing. Closed. Done. I, for one, am speaking against you voting on that contract tonight. I am pleading with you, respectfully, to table it. Remember who you work for. Remember that you don't work for Michael Caine. He should be your development partner not your boss. You are the city of Portsmouth City Council. Please lead like that because I know you're all capable of it. Thank you. Thank you. Additional speakers, Peter. Uh, Peter Way Allen, <clears throat> I live at 100 Gate Street. Uh, Mayor McEachran and John Tabor, I serve with you on the McIntyre Committee. I'm just going to start out with, um, you know, I was elected as a city councilor, and one of the first things that I was faced with was a letter from the Redgate Kane attorney, Bruce Falby, threatening the city. That was December 30th before I even took office. And that's kind of how this thing has gone all the way through. Uh, Redgate Kane has cajoled, threatened, sued, settled, sued again. And I'm a pretty patient guy. You know, in my prior life, before I retired and started fishing, fly fishing, I used to negotiate Teamster contracts in New York. And um, talk about some high dra drama and all, I've taken strikes, I've done it all. But this developer has done nothing but threaten and control. And November 18th, I stand by that decision. I terminated that development agreement, or I made the motion to do that. And we negotiated in good faith. And Bob Sullivan, you know that. For two years, we negotiated in good faith with Red Gay Kane. And they did nothing but to put up roadblocks all the time. So on the 18th, I made the motion and we terminated that development agreement. And we've kind of, we, we moved on. I mean, it was time for the city to move on. Push Red Gay Kane to the side, let them sue, fight that, get a new development partner, do an RFP, that's what we did. And we had one that came in, Carlisle Capital, Bill Binney, and he said, I'll do the project. It won't cost the taxpayers anything in Portsmouth. I'm not saying that's the greatest thing going, but it certainly was better than Red Gate Gain. And I'm a taxpayer now. We have a reevaluation coming. I'm assuming the city budget's going to come out. It's going to be $140 million or whatever the number is. 
The taxpayers in this town cannot afford to give Redgate Kane $2.4 million to start. That's only the start. And it's going to continue on. And each, I was very cognizant when I was a counselor. I represented everybody in this city. And we talk about affordable housing. We're going to have hundreds of residents who are not going to be able to afford their taxes. So I urge you, you have it out tonight. You have a citizen lawsuit that's in court right now. This agreement gives you the out to get out of it or to table this motion and this spending. Let's see how that lawsuit plays out. This agreement, Attorney Monroe, you, have you read this? I mean, this gives the city no outs at all. It's horrible. Everything in this is, is awful. And, you know, I, I bet, and I'm not going to ask Bob this, I bet Bruce Falby wrote this for Sobo Squared for Michael Caine and Ralph Cox. And we signed off on it. That's what happened. Where's Michael Conley? Michael Conley was a great attorney. He's the one, when Redgate Kane sued in March, Michael Conley, representing the city of Portsmouth, went at Redgate Kane and got them to get into an interim agreement and, and to stop the lawsuit because we threatened to counter sue. Redgate Kane was being a bully, and we went right back at him as a city of Portsmouth, and we rightly should have. Three weeks before the election, Redgate Kane restarts their lawsuit. We all know what happened. That's what, that's what happened. And he did it on purpose. And I won't get into any more details about that. But you have a chance tonight. You can punt on this. You can say, let's wait for the lawsuit to play out at Rockingham Superior Court. You represent the citizens. There is 30 of them there today, and probably more coming. This is a big deal. This is a 100-year project in Portsmouth, and that's the way I always looked at it. When I was chair of that committee, I always tried to be fair. I never put my finger on it one way or the other. But I got to tell you, November 18th, I'm a patient guy. I'm tired of it. Ray Gay Kane sued us, threatened us all the way through. So I urge you tonight to table this decision. Give it two weeks. There's no rush. Redgate Kane, you know, I'm sure, I mean, they haven't spent the money yet. But you have taxpayers out here. You have a responsibility, fiduciary responsibility, to the taxpayers of Portsmouth. There's no receipts. No receipts. Were they reading the tea leaves? What is it? I'd love to get a check for $2.4 million. But you represent the taxpayers. Please table this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Esther Kennedy, 41 Pickering Ave. Um, the McIntyre has been around for a long time. Uh, when I went on council in 2006, it was the McIntyre. Um, on November 18th, when that vote came forward, I said, I gave, we gave you a gift. We broke everything. We gave you the gift to start fresh. Now, on social media, that was hit pretty hard but it was a gift. Today, the citizens gave you another gift. They gave you some time. You have a lawsuit now. We've also given you a gift of saying that we support you taking that time and thinking about it. GSA gave you a gift, sounds like you came today, by saying the McIntyre, they'll continue the agreement with you and give you time. You have the time. 
research it, figure it out. None of us here are making a cent off of this. We're spending hours because we all love the city. And as the city attorney said today, he believes that this is a 400th year biggest project, according to the paper at least, who knows if it was right. I would disagree. I think there's a lot of other things that happened in the 400 years that were probably really big, but it is a big deal. The citizens came forward, 600 plus submitted information saying they wanted a different project. We worked to try to get that project switched. We tried. I was not in favor of it. I was ready to throw Kane out the, the day I walked in. But some other comrades on the city council wanted to continue to work with this entity <coughs> to see if they could get the citizens project. And they tried. And it didn't happen. All we have is a payment. A huge payment. So what I'm asking you tonight is to take the gifts people giving you. You've chosen to give the gift back on the 18th. That was your choice to re-gift it. But given the fact that GSA today has said you have time, the citizen's lawsuit has caused you to have time. Look at that contract. Everyone's right. There's no outs. There's a lot of money. And if Kane sues you, he sues you. Look how long Boyle has been on the, on the books and no one seems to care about that one. And we're up to millions in that one. But this is a big project. This is the center of our town. And it's going to be up to you folks to make sure you're right. And no one here, I mean, people went there today. I couldn't go because of work, but people went there today on their own time. They're not getting anything out of it. All they're getting is a, because they love the city and they want to sure, make sure the city is treated appropriately like our predecessors have. So they did it for you. And now it's up to you to take the time and get it right. Get that contract right. And make sure it's your contract and not management's contract. You're the council. And make sure you have input and decisions will be made right. So we're asking you to do the right thing, take some time, evaluate, make sure that you have outs in that contract, make sure we're not paying millions of dollars for no evidence. You, we've given it to you. It's up to you to choose how to use it right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers? Zalita Morgan, um, Richards Avenue. Um, it is very disturbing because, you know, after hearing um, the speakers tonight and witnessing as a resident our long awaited um, seizing a property that was given to us from, for a nominal fee of $1. Lots of dreams, desires of having community space, and yes, have some, um, you know, benefit developer, but above all, make sure we honor community. Just keep in mind, we lost a community space, which was the old Coney Bean, right? Riding town. We don't have many community spaces in town. I think history with this um, developer of choice or, or whatever um, has not been good. You have the chance right now, if I understood correctly, to please think through in the terms of the agreement are really outrageous. How could you, how can you approve such a, an agreement that leaves all of us on a loose end. How can you? And all that we're asking, I am asking you, please, you can do this. You can pause, not vote on this tonight. You don't have to. Wait until 
this loss, of the courts come with some feedback. I mean, we have already, it, it's unbelievable. Imagine you before you, you, you are, are, are sworn in, you are already, you know, subject of a lawsuit. <laughs> this is incredible. And this is on and on. And for as long as the lawyers are there and you are in your non-public meetings, there is no transparency, right? So what is discussed in there, it's in there. It's locked. So they have everything, actually, because they control the narrative. You cannot say anything, <laughs> but they can pull the strings. It is just insidious, the relationship, personally, I think. But right now, all that I'm asking you is to really cool, to give the time that you, take the time that you have right now and revisit the, ter the terms, the terms absolutely. If the city, if we taxpayers <laughs> have no way out, this is a bad deal. I don't know when and who would ever sign such a deal. You know, <coughs> no one in good conscience would do that. So I have not read the entire thing. I have looked at pieces of it, but here we are. You have the opportunity to just let's wait for, for the lawsuit. There is time. You've got some good news from the government side. So please just take a step back right now. You don't have to get into this. There is wisdom, really, in taking a deep breath step back if you can, and you can. My father used to say that um, sometimes uh, a step back is a strategic uh, move for when you go forward next time. And I think that's a strategic, it's a wisdom, really. I think you have been given like a, an opportunity to uh, apply your wisdom with the time that you have gained right now. So please, uh, for the taxpayers, for our community, if you prize the community, who has been waiting so long for seizing this space, a dollar bill, remember that, and what is it coming out to, right? It's, I don't have words for that, but please, just take a step back, use your wisdom, thanks so much. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, I'm Michael Simchick. I live at 260 Pioneer Road, <clears throat> excuse me, in Rye, New Hampshire. Um, I own three properties um, in downtown Portsmouth, all of which were probably considered a butters uh, to the McIntyre site. So I, I hope I have some standing as the term was used earlier tonight. Um, Mayor McEachern, Council Member, City Manager Kennard, um, this is a very difficult project. It's not a difficult decision, I don't think, right now, but it's a very difficult project. But I heard something tonight, and I don't want to rehash what everybody's gone through because you've all heard it too many times, but I heard something tonight that made me really happy. And I don't think it happened in the previous administration, but I think, City Manager Kennard, I heard you say that this agreement was vetted uh, by the city's financial team as well as your financial advisors. Um, I'm assuming that you shared that with the counselors I'm sure they've all dug right into the numbers. Um, even if they don't all understand the numbers, I'm sure they dug into the numbers. Um, but it's a very difficult project, as I said. And the only way you can do a, a financial analysis on a difficult project is to do a sensitivity analysis. Uh, analysis. Is it a $20 million investment because it's a reduced project versus what the Kane Redgate team wanted to do earlier? Is it a $40 million project? Is it a $60 million? Or is it a bigger one? Is it an $80 million project? You would, you would then know not only $2 million that we're talking about now, that's, that's serious money. That's really serious money. But what you really don't know, unless you dug into that financial analysis, is what is the money downstream going to cost us? I will guarantee you that in this project, under this agreement, Whatever you pay right now, even if you do approve this egregious settlement, it'll be a pittance in comparison to what you're committing the city to. 
The National Park Service took issue with the Kane Redgate's 18% return on equity. They said it was too much money. Well, the devil's in the details. I would assume that the National Park Service um, anticipated a traditional real estate type financing where there was 25% equity in the deal. 18% would have been on that 25% equity. The National Park Service said that was too much money. In those details, in your agreement now, it says that the Kane Redgate team is willing to accept a 7.4% return. Now, that sounds good at face value, but it's a 7.4% unlevered return. It's 7.4% on 100% cost of the project. Whereas if it was a $60 million deal initially, with 15 million in equity, it'd be 18% on 15 million, roughly $2.7 million. If it's 7.4% on $60 million, it's $4.4 million to the Kane Redgate team. I assume you all know that because that must have been in the financial analysis. In other words, in other words, every the 7.4% actually generates a return to the Kane Redgate team that is 64% more, 64% more than the return that the National Park Service already said was egregious and too much. I would ask you, Mayor McEachern, um, in the, in the, in the, from the aspects of transparency, this project's all about the money. The design's going to work itself out, but it's all about the money. It's not about the legal stuff. It's about the money. And there's only one way for the, for the community to understand that, is to be, the community should be able to see that financial analysis, which City Manager Kennard says has already been done. If you want to sell this to the city, you need to share that with them. And what you can't do is you can't make a big deal about the $2.4 million, which is a hell of a lot of money. It's the money you're committing downstream under that kind of an egregious deal. That's all I ask you to do is, is first, I, I, whether, you, whether you punt or you don't punt, whether the lawsuit in, in Brentwood wins or doesn't win, that's going to all play itself out. But you all have to have the courage to ask for that financial analysis and take a look at it and see if based on that financial analysis, you're willing to commit the city of Portsmouth to this kind of a deal. Thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Any other speakers? <clears throat> That's it. I will be closing the public hearing. Any additional council questions? Councilor Denton. So, I, it's a statement followed by a question. Uh, this council has been acting in good faith from re-entering the initial agreement to uh, settling the lawsuit uh, with the settlement agreement recently. So the question is, would not approving these funds then not <clears throat> be in good faith because it would be in breach of the settlement agreement? I'm really not at liberty to discuss a lot of the possible situations that could happen because um, we could be in further litigation. Um, and I really can't be in a position of having said what I think would create liability and would not create liability. Um, the, uh, you know, in this McIntyre situation already, we're two lawsuits going on right at the moment. Uh, and the possibility that something else could happen is is very real. So I really feel that it would not be wise of me to speculate on what the future might hold in terms of that. Councilor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I actually just have a clarifying question. Um, because I think it's important um, people keep asking general questions about, you know, maybe you didn't need this, you could have an extension with the GSA, now you have an extension, you know, we can delay. 
Would the GSA have given us an extension without the agreement? May I answer? Sure. Well, first off, we don't have the extension. But we're working on that. We are hoping to get the extension. Mm -hmm. We have every reason to believe we will get the extension, but we don't have it. Okay. Uh, I do feel that the fact that the city was working so diligently and so assiduously to sell this case so that we would be able to move ahead with the monument program and we would not have been able to do it without settling the case. The lawsuit itself would have prevented us. I do think that GSA was af affected by that development in it making its hopeful decision to give us the extension. Councilor Moreau. <clears throat> Just for further clarification, and I think, Attorney Sullivan, you'll be able to tell everyone in the public at home um, that there was no, pretty much no chance of us going through the monument program without settling this lawsuit, which is, I think, what I just heard you say to everyone. And that, you know, I want everyone to understand that our council was not just what is in this room, that Attorney Connolly was a counsel for us during all of this, and that we did have um, financial counsel as well. So all of that counsel was part of uh, going into our decision, and that we would most likely, you know, be out if it wasn't for that. Both of those statements that you just made are correct. Councillor Tabor. Um, yeah, a couple of three points. Uh, question. Uh, unless we wanted to buy this land outright, which would be seven times the amount we're talking about to settle this lawsuit, uh, we need a public private partnership. That's always been the, it's always been the, the modus operandi, unless we as the city want to start running bulldozers and develop something in a project. And if we partner with a private entity, we're going to have mutual obligations that will be more than two years. Um, I think there's been some concern that this binds future councils. Well, the city has to enter into a partnership to get this done. Um, and. You know, to me, it's, yes, we're concerned about taxpayers. We're accountable to taxpayers. It's their money. And do we fight in court to prove a point at great expense and get nothing done? Or do we put the taxpayer the money to work to get the project done? And it's not the 2019 project. It's a new project that was done with a lot of community input. Um, I just think that's the right course. Um, and uh, so I think those are considerations that we make, um, and we're accountable for those decisions. Thank you, Councillor Tabor. <clears throat> There's no other comments. Oh, Councillor Bullock. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'd just like to state that these decisions are very hard. I, I do not walk up here knowing how I'm going to make my decision. Um, I like to listen to everyone. I talk to people that email me, people that call me, people that voted for me, people that knock on my door, people um, that their child is on my Little League team. Um, I'm very interacted with the community of Portsmouth. Um, I'm down downtown almost every day. Um, you know, I talk to at least you know a couple handfuls of people a day, and they give me their honest opinions. I don't see any of those people here tonight. Um, there's hundreds of people I've talked to that are not here tonight that have spoken differently and do support us signing this agreement. Um, so I take, I factor all the factors in, the money, where we stand, where we're going, um, but I do think that this is the best route for Portsmouth. Thank you, Councillor Boylock. So, oh, Councillor Denton. I simply ask that everyone in the public keep this, things in perspective. Um, yes, the McIntyre has divided this community for years now. 
And yes, no one is excited by the settlement agreement, for it is very much so a settlement agreement. However, uh, this is actually a problem that many communities in the U.S. might actually like to have, potentially getting a beautiful piece of property that could be developed towards a plan which many in the community overwhelmingly approved. And when it comes back to keeping things in perspective, please don't compare uh, Mr. Kane to a dictator, seeing as there is a dictator currently invading a foreign country. Mr. Mahan, I see you laughing right now. Yeah, that's just an absurd comment. Now, a gentleman came in here and he compared Mr. Kane to a dictator. Hey, Likewise, he is. Let's keep the conversation among the council. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Councillor Dutton. Um, so I'll, I'll get to the McIntyre, uh, this, the appropriation in a second. I'd, I'd like to spend a, just a minute on why I ask people not to applaud. And again, if it's a celebration when we're all on the same side, um, we've had state champions come through here. We had a new poet laureate. Uh, there's a time when we are all unified uh, behind a, a common purpose. The McIntyre is not one of those, those things. It's devolved into uh, one side against another side. And I've seen it, <clears throat> as former Councilor Whalen has pointed out, I, I, I lived it, and I would argue spend a, about as much time as uh, as most people um, on the McIntyre, at least in the last three years. Um, but we're not going to get anywhere um, when we all get exactly what we want and when we're cheering for our side. And so that's why I ask not to applaud, because I don't feel it's moving us in the direction of resolution. Now, I will be supporting this appropriation this evening. I've already supported the settlement agreement, um, and this has become a conversation about the settlement agreement itself, uh, even more than the uh, appropriation of money uh, to live up to the, to the settlement agreement, as well as the design costs that we estimate to be 400000 And the reason why I do is because I valued the time that I spent on the McIntyre subcommittee looking to build the community plan. And I believe that this is the best possible way. I do believe that without uh, a settlement and a settlement uh, with our development partner, we would not have the opportunity to put forth an application to the National Park Service. That is my, my belief that our time had run out with the MPS and the GSA in order to do so. I further believe that I know that there, is, there are many people in the audience tonight that disagree with me, but I further believe that the cost to settle this lawsuit was the best available option when our other option was to take it to court. And so given that, I, I voted to settle the case. Now, tonight before us, we have what is uh, how we're going to fund that. Um, as Councilor, or former Councilor Huda asked, how can we, um, how can we, uh, uh, I guess, hold future councils um, uh, beholden to the actions that we take? That is the essence of contracts. That is the essence of what we had before us. In the previous contract, we had opportunities to exit from that notice secure, and we chose not to, to go down that route, um, instead terminating the agreement. Uh, and again, every action that, that, that I am voting for as one member of nine is because I believe it is in the best interest of the city of Portsmouth to do so in order to build the community plan through the National Park Service Monument Transfer Program. I understand that many in the audience disagree with that, 
But that is what I will be supporting, and I'd ask Kelly to call the roll. Assistant Mayor Kelly? No. Councillor Tabor? Yes. Councillor Denton? Yes. Councillor Moreau? Yes. Councillor Bagley's not here. Councillor Lombardi? Yes. Councillor Blaylock? Yes. Councillor Cook? Yes. Mayor McCaffrey? Yes. Motion passes eight, uh, seven to one. Okay, with that, we'll take a five minute recess.
Yeah, nice one like the teenage nest. All right, welcome back. Uh, next on the agenda is, I think in five minutes I would have had that up. Um, actually, I will wait a motion to pull up uh, under, let's see, under, oh, uh, section 13. Um, Number or letter E, letter from Attorney Sherilyn Burnett, Young, Rath, Young, and Pignatelli uh, regarding application for urbanized shoreland exemption. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd make a motion to uh, suspend the rules so that we can bring forward uh, number 13E under presentations and written communications. Second. So, All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Yeah. Do we have a, uh, a presentation? We do not. Or any written communication? Okay. <laughs> and the, well, the, uh, uh, the natural order of this um, is to refer to the, the planning board, as I understand that, uh, Attorney Sullivan? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. So I will await that motion. I'd make a motion that we move to refer the, to the planning board for a report back. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Yep. <laughs> Back to the <coughs> regularly scheduled events. We're up to the city manager's items which require action. Thank you, Your Honor. We have one action tonight, and it's a one-year lease extension of the South Meeting House owned by the City of Portsmouth by Portsmouth Public Media, Inc., or PPM-TV as we know them. We have entered into two five-year leases with them. The most recent uh, extension was a one-year extension, which is set to expire this Thursday. PPMTV is seeking one more one-year extension. The reason is partly due to the pandemic, uh, and the one-year lease extension was granted last year in part to allow PPMTV and the city to jointly apply for a grant from the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance to perform a preservation assessment in order to assist the city and PPMTV to create a schedule of prioritized capital projects for future repairs. And a reminder to those that may not be as familiar, PPMTV is obligated to expend what it would have otherwise been assessed as, as real estate taxes to make capital improvements to the property. So we're in the process of trying to determine what those capital improvements are and what they might cost and how we would go about that work. So in order to best do that, we're looking for a one-year extension for them at the South Meeting House. So I Mr. Mayor? Mm -hmm. I have to recuse myself uh, from this discussion because I'm on the board of Friends of the South End and they're named in the agreement. Okay. And I'd like to move um, to approve that, but I also have a question about it. Okay. If we have a second. I'll second. Can... My question is just simple. How they, they pay in lieu of taxes or the amount in, that they would pay in taxes toward the um, Toward, toward the work on the right we, is my understanding and deputy city attorney and deputy city manager Suzanne Woodlands here if we have questions but it's my understanding the city and PPM TV work to understand the breadth of uh, capital improvements needed to the facility we work with them to achieve those and and their okay. payment is in recognition of what they might otherwise pay in taxes okay and we don't we don't have a number for that I we don't have a number because we're working to properly assess what needs to be done and, and how best to achieve that. Okay. And if we can understand that, we could then consider a longer term, we could potentially consider a longer term lease with PPM TV. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Oh, wait, can we do a roll call? Uh, all in yeah, we can. Just, we didn't need a, okay, just one abstention. <laughs> Got it. All right, next up, the consent agenda. Proper motion uh, is to move to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Um, again, again, I just have a question about these polls. Um, are they are they new polls or are they replacement polls? I mean, are these going into? That's a great question. 
think I'm going to look to the staff for that answer. They're they're not replacement poles. These are new poles. These are new poles. Net they're new all poles. new poles. New poles. Yes. These are new poles. Thanks, yes. Kelly. You're welcome. So that goes. That's as a result of the construction on Borthwick and all these roads. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up is the rest of the presentations and written communication. Uh, first up is email correspondence. Sample motion moved to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, we've had the presentation from Valerie and Susan, and we got the button. Um, next up is a letter uh, from the town of Rye Selectman to the PDA regarding the proposed cargo facilities. Sample motion moved to accept and place on file. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up is a letter from Jim Tietzel of Wilcox Industries regarding Portsmouth 400-year concept plan. Sample motion moved to refer to the city manager. I, I would like to address that. Would you like to make the sample motion? Um, what, I, what I would, yes, I would like to make a motion that um, this be referred to the um, Arts and Culture <coughs> committee um, because it is a um, it's really a piece of art that's going uh, um, or a monument that is going to be placed uh, and I think that should be have a review from the arts and culture committee since seeing that we have no the art speak is not existent right now and we don't have a art review committee at this time okay um, Councilor Cook or first we need a second on that second Councilor Cook yes thank you mayor as a representative of the, the arts oh, and nonprofits um, this is a, a difficult um, situation always when art comes before the council because the processes that we had in place no longer um, truly work for considering um, art because ArtSpeak was the referral organization prior. Um, this is something that uh, I intend to bring before the governance committee to look at those policies and to look at our ordinance and to make changes to those to reflect the current situation or current practice. But right now we don't truly have a good process um, for accepting public art and public art donations. Um, I think it's entirely reasonable for it to go to arts and nonprofits and for them to make a recommendation. Um, but currently that is not their expertise either. Um, and the only mechanism we have truly to set up a committee to review public art is through um, the ordinance for art with capital expenditures. And so we really don't have uh, a process at this stage. Um, arts and nonprofits could act as an interim until we change those policies um, since ArtSpeak does not exist. Councilor Tabor. Um, yes, question for the city manager. I, I recall we had a situation like this in the last term and we set up a process, a sort of interim process. Could you we speak did. to that? I'm, I'm happy to, through the mayor. There were two instances since I've been here and since we've not had Art Speak where we've had to stand up a, an ad hoc process, if you will, and it was the recommendation of staff for the first one, which I, which I believe was involved the fish at McEachern oh, yeah. Park. Yeah. And yes. the second one was a piece of art that is currently hung in City Hall. And at the time, Nancy Carmer recommended an ad hoc committee of several different folks to meet and to discuss um, <coughs> the criteria by which Art, art Speak used to use um, for art. So we could we could certainly do that again, um, and or we could um, work with the Arts and Nonprofit Committee. I I don't want to get in the way of the current motion. But I'm just here to provide information on how we did do it two different times. Um, Councilor Lombardi. I, I, I actually had a conversation with Russ Grazier and um, 
Barbara? Uh, I've, I've forgotten the woman's name. Barbara. What? Barbara Massey. Barbara, Barbara, yes. And, um, and they thought it, they could provide um, a committee to look at it if that were to be our vote. Um, if you, if the council would prefer to have an ad hoc committee set up for this pro specific project, um, maybe something needs to be done in the long run, obviously, uh, to deal with public art because um, I think we are at risk of you know, having things um, <coughs> donated to the city and put up that have no review and um, might not really represent what the city wants. So, mm -hmm. okay. Councilor Moreau. Might I just put forward a, rec a possibility, a uh, recommendation is that considering this is done in conjunction with the 400th and in that realm we have an arts and culture um, pillar on top of having a legacy project pillar, which could actually uh, offer a couple of people from each of those groups to be able to look into it. Because the legacy projects are going to be like statues and things that are going to be here for a very long period of time. And there's, I mean, 20 plus artists that are involved in the arts and culture um, pillar. So I think we could very easily get a team leader to recommend a couple of people that could actually help on that. I mean, this appears to be quite a permanent installation. In granite. Yeah. Is that a, uh, Councillor Cook, that wasn't a motion. That was no, it's just a suggestion. Councillor <laughs> Cook. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I would also say that uh, I have been working with some of our, our local organizations that um, do do uh, public art projects to look at our our current policies and the ordinance to make changes. Um, so uh, the Arts and Nonprofits Committee is already kind of connected to those groups and understands kind of their role in the community. And um, I think it would be easy to draw from um, some of those groups as well, as well as uh, ad hoc committees that served in the past to review public art projects. Um, specifically, I think of the project at the Foundry Garage. Any other comments? So the vote or the motion on the table is to refer to the Arts and Nonprofit Committee. Any comments? I think it'll work. I'm looking at John because he he's <laughs> looks like he's about to. <laughs> the wheels are turning. The wheels turning. Um, I wonder if Councillor Lombardi would like to <clears throat> withdraw his motion and alter it to use an ad hoc process uh, or would you like to continue hmm. I, I don't I don't know I have to, um, I guess either is is fine so I, I if you I think it's better for me to withdraw that motion and put it to an ad hoc process. I think my vote would be for an ad hoc process, but I, um, I can only speak for my vote. Um, well, okay, I guess I would withdraw the motion. Okay. And I guess uh, Councillor Moreau seconded it, I believe. I seconded it. Oh, I'm fine with the withdrawal. Okay, so now we have back on refer to the city manager, coordinate the public art process. Um, I would look for a motion to move to refer to the city manager to coordinate the public art process in conjunction with, and this is something that I'm adding, uh, the arts and uh, nonprofit uh, committee, uh, as well as the uh, Portsmouth 400th uh, committee, 
and report back to the city council for the final approval. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next up, letter from a. Oh, uh, did we get this one? We did this one already. That's, All right. That was, did, yeah. Yes. Okay. Under my name, appointments to be voted. We have the appointment of Michael Griffin to the Portsmouth Housing Authority, reappointment of Robert Bogardis to the Rec Board, and the reappointment of Corey uh, Sumerian uh, to the Rec Board. All in favor? Well, oh, oh sorry. I need a. I need a motion. Okay. <laughs> I make a motion that we appoint. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> it's been a long day. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So next, uh, we have uh, Councillor Denton and Councillor Cook, and I will let you bring Thank forth you. the motion. So, I motion to approve and send the draft zoning ordinance amendments regarding electric vehicle charging stations to the Planning Board for review and recommendation back to the City Council for first reading. Second. So I'm going to just <laughs> speak this if I may. Uh, this council recently approved $150,000 every year for the next five years within the CIP for public infrastructure. These amendments here will help private infrastructure throughout Portsmouth. And essentially it will remove both regulatory obstacles and the need to apply for variances or special permits for those privately owned electric vehicle charging stations. Um, something which I learned in researching this is that RSA 67416 expressly grants the power to adopt innovative land use controls like this. It's essentially what many of our uh, zoning ordinances are based off of. And in case people don't know what they're looking at here, because this could be a little confusing, as is the zoning ordinance, it is incredibly confusing. The zoning ordinance actually has all of the definitions at the very end of it under Article 15. So though it's on page three here, I just structured this in the order it would fit in the current zoning ordinance. So I'm just gonna touch on it briefly, in terms of general applicability, what each one of these things would mean, um, at least the intent going to the planning board. So level one and level two electric vehicle charging stations as accessory use. So. As it says here, a uh, level one charging station, 120 volts or equivalent. Uh, again, that's something which most people might have at their home with an EV. It might take 12 hours or longer <coughs> to charge an electric vehicle. And a level two, the 240 volt, um, you see those on numerous uh, pieces of privately owned property throughout Portsmouth. We also have some on public property already, those which could take around eight to 10 hours to charge a vehicle. And when it says as an accessory use, it's just for that. It's the secondary use of the property. So if the primary use of the property is residential, that stays the same. If the primary use of the property is business, that stays the same. This is solely for an accessory use. Uh, likewise, the level three electric vehicle charging stations as an accessory use. Um, level three, the, the DC fast chargers, which came up previously, uh, they are very expensive. Uh, around $120,000, I believe, is what was recently quoted for one. But these are the ones which could charge an electric vehicle in about 30 minutes. And um, here, they are, again, accessory to the primary permitted use of the property. So those are the first two definitions. And the third definition is electric vehicle charging station as a primary use. So when you think about this, whether it be level one, level two, level three, there's only been one example of this recently in New Hampshire. This is in Rochester, where the primary use of a um, DC fast charger station, which went in just off Route 16 by the Walmart, that's the primary use of that business. So those are the three differences, and I guess by comparison to uh, the level three as an accessory use in Seabrook, people keep talking about Seabrook now has EV um, fast chargers. Those were all accessory uses by both the Panera Bread and by the um, uh, Walmart, which is essentially on the same piece of property. So I'm gonna jump back up to the purpose of applicability. And I worked with a couple people on this from, um, you know, Tom Morgan reached out. He is in fact a, uh, I'll call him a city planner. I know that's the, not the right term. Um, likewise with uh, Tom Watson from the EDC, something that they've been wanting to see for a while because there have been a number of electric vehicle chargers or businesses that have looked in Portsmouth and they've been discouraged by the current zoning. Um, so 
this chart where table of uses, so this essentially lists um, different uh, uses and then the different districts throughout. Now, by no means are these the actual um, final determination which I expect the planning board to make on these. This is just what I came up with as the best idea. For um, motor vehicle related uses, we included electric vehicle charging stations as a principal use there. And to make sure this is distinctly different than the current gas station requirements, because for fuel stations and requirements, this has been an issue where someone's wanted to come in and install one of these chargers, and they're like, well, the closest <coughs> thing in the zoning is a gas station, which requires four walls, a roof, it needs center islands, and this needs to be separate because all you really need for this is a parking lot. And then if you look on the right under supplemental regulations, it lists two of the three which I came up with um, there. The third one's probably the most interesting one, I'll be interested in the planning board's feedback, is on landscaping and screening. Um, when you hear landscaping and screening, think of the uh, wooden boxes which go around some dumpsters. That's essentially screening. And here it wouldn't require screening for the uh, I might get this wrong, the transformers that go with the DC fast chargers because that has been discouraging some from going in. And then the next category were the accessory uses and that just falls right in our current zoning where the current accessory uses are for both the level one and level two and level three being separate. And just to give the public a general idea who I highly doubt is looking at this chart right now, the goal essentially is to allow level one and level two electric vehicle chargers um, throughout the city. When it comes to level three electric vehicle chargers um, as a accessory use, I should say the first level one, level two as accessory use throughout the city, level three is far more restrictive in when it would, where it would be allowed, so not necessarily in residential neighborhoods. And then the most restrictive one would be the electric vehicle charging stations as a principal use. That would be more in the business districts where you would expect to find gas stations and those kind of things. Um, again, the goal here is to send this to the planning board. I've spoken with the uh, chair of the planning board who was interested in this subject and um, have them report back to us a version of this so we could help the private industry <coughs> in Portsmouth develop our EV infrastructure. Thank you, Councillor Denton. Councillor Cook, anything to add? I think that Councillor Denton covered everything in detail. Everything? I think he did. And so just a, a, a quick question. Uh, right now, current process, if you want to add home charging, that requires a, uh, a permit or a, a variance or no? Yes, on a permit. I'm not positive on the variance because okay. it's not listed currently anywhere in the zoning as an accessory. Okay. Councilor Moreau? Um, I guess my only concern is that we've already put a lot on the plate of the planning board and um, it would be helpful if we'd be allowed to work this into the phases of the work plan that we're already going to be reviewing. Therefore, um, we're not adding an additional thing and that hopefully, I mean, my concern is to overwork both the planning board and the planning staff because we have to do a deep dive review to make sure it doesn't conflict with anything else in our extremely complex zoning, which takes a lot of time for that to be which, researched. If I could respond to that. So um, that's one of the questions which came up with the planning board chairs, like, hey, this upcoming Thursday's the first work session we have mm -hmm. on the current one. Should I try to slip this in here? I want to defer to the city manager and planning staff on um, what makes the most sense to get this in front of the planning board. It might make the most sense to wait until the next work session on the next phase, but I know it makes the most sense as a city council just to have an ordinance presented to us versus phase one, this, phase two, something else. But um, I'm totally fine with deferring to the city manager and what makes the best use of time but I think it's good to simply send this to the planning board and go from there. Yeah, typically as a council, we can't, even for report backs, can't ask for a timeline on any report backs. So it'll ultimately be on the planning board to define when y'all get to it and then, uh, <laughs> and then get it back to us. Mm -hmm. Councilor Cook? Uh, I have a question in that line um, for Councillor Moreau, actually. Um, would it be better if we sent this to the Land Use Committee to incorporate into the schedule for what's going to the Planning Board? Okay. Um, it would be 
my advice, I mean, I we have a meeting on May 13th, and, and uh, Councilor Bagley had already brought up the wanting to incorporate that, so I was going to talk to the group about whether or not we could incorporate, if it made sense to incorporate that into phase two of our plans moving forward. Um, so that was my plan already. I didn't know until this was already on the agenda this was coming forward, so yeah. I, I think it would make sense for us to take a look at it and see if that fits in with uh, what we'll be looking at, and I can certainly <coughs> defer to the city manager uh, to talk to the planning director and see whether or not she thinks that's a fit as well. Councilor Denton. My only hesitation with that is if we send it to the land use committee, it would then come back to us or might not come back to us. Um, it, Before it goes to the planning board. Correct. I mean, we are plan on having those changes for phase two would um, come through here just to refer to the planning board. Yes. Okay. But there may be some changes to it before that. I don't know. Okay. Councilor Tabor. Um, I, I tend to agree with Councilor Denton on this that uh, we would set the policy direction of approving these changes and I think Councillor Denton's explained them in detail to us and referring it to the planning board and they could schedule it at their convenience. I'll leave that so up. The mayor to says we can't set that deadline for them but we would at least get the policy uh, direction going. Okay. okay. Um, if there's no further comment or any amendments, we'll take this as a roll call vote. Okay. Assistant Mayor Kelly? Yes. Councilor Tabor? Yes. Councilor Denton? Yes. Councilor Moreau? Yes. Councilor Bagley is not present this evening. Councilor Lombardi? Yes. Councilor Blaylock? Yes. Councilor Cook? Yes. Mayor McCachron? Yes. All right. Um, next up, oh, so Councilor Bagley, uh, not here, so his agenda items, um, I actually haven't run into this before. Um, are there, we can't bring up anything under his name. Is anything time sensitive that would be uh, like the um, request for ADA parking space on Cass Street by Connections Peer Support Center? I, I wouldn't want to make the assumption that they can wait another uh, two weeks. Um, and I don't know the genesis of this. Is this something that came from um, uh, the PTS yep. asking for action on this? And then I guess a legal question, uh, could somebody else make the motion uh, or could we do it under miscellaneous having this been on the agenda? Uh, yes, Your Honor, somebody else could make the motion. Okay. And yes, Your Honor, this was a specific request by the organization listed here at the April PTS meeting. Okay. Um, and then on the the second one, the parking and traffic safety uh, committee action sheet, could that wait until the return of Councilor Bagley? Or is that something, do we need something, is action needed from that? I think we, we could take, uh, I, I, don't, I don't want to speak for, for Bob, but I think it, 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 it could be good business to move the, the business of PTS forward. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would require immediate attention, but. Um. Councilor Tabor. Um, wouldn't we need to approve the minutes to get the 60 day extension of the neighborhood parking program? And uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was wondering too. Okay, so we'll take them both up. Um, so I'll, I'll wait a motion. Um. I'd make the motion that we move to approve HP parking space 30 feet from the crosswalk on the north side of Cass Street, east of Islington Street. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, I'd also make a motion to move to accept and approve the action sheet and minutes of the April 7, 2022 Parking and Traffic Safety Committee meetings. Second. All Second. in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next up, Councilor Cook and Assistant Mayor Kelly. Who's going to be making the motion? Mayor, um, thank you. Uh, 
We move to request that the city manager develop a series of community conversations starting in June 2020 around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. 2022? I'm sorry, 2022. <laughs> Second, Your Honor. Any discussion would either of you want to speak to the motion? Um, we are making this request um, with the idea that the city manager with the support of the city council um, would work with the staff to develop a schedule for community conversations um, and that would start in June 2022 um, discussing issues <coughs> of diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And the city would just serve, the city council would serve as a convener of those discussions with community members. Um, so we would bring in community experts to lead and guide the sessions um, rather than expecting the council to do so. And the initiative would reinforce the citywide organizational goal of supporting diversity in the city and throughout the community. Assistant Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in, in having these discussions with Councillor Cook um, about this, we, we feel like there's a little bit of a, of a gap in our community right now, which is from, from City Hall to the streets to the nonprofits. Um, and there, there's several things, as was mentioned by former um, Councillor Esther Kennedy earlier, is that I think a lot of times when we think about DEI right now, especially in this climate, we think about race and gender, but it, it stretches far, much farther than that. Um, we're talking about um, ge gender, sexuality, um, accessibility, social economic um, differences in our, in our community. Um, and so we wanted to bring, um, you know, as we, I think as a council have always said, we want to bring City Hall to the community. Um, so the goal would be that these conversations would not be held in City Hall. We would team up with other nonprofits. We'd team up with restaurateurs. We'd team up, you know, um, at Prescott Park. We'd, we'd really bring um, and try to just facilitate conversations within our community. And I think that it's something that is really exciting. And, um, you know, as we flesh out this idea and talk to local community members about it, it, it really is exciting. We have a lot of these things that happen um, pretty organically in our community, but bringing in the city element to it, I think is gonna be a really good, a good thing. Thank you, Sister Mayor. Any other comments or questions? This is for a report back, as I understand, reading uh, or, um, develop. oh, develop. So develop, will these come before the, the council for approval or, or is this going for, I guess, what's the next step after this? Um, I would argue that um, the next step is really in the city manager's court. Okay. The goal is to ask her to make the call on setting, setting up this series of conversations, of community conversations. Um, and I, we wanted to leave some flexibility there because um, only the city manager can determine when staff has the time um, to devote to um, this specific task. Um, clearly, it shouldn't require a lot of organization, but it will require some. And sure. so we wanted to leave it to her um, to determine um, what the best schedule is. Okay. And I think, just Susan. to add on that, um, as Councillor Cook just said, this is not limited to what we have written in here. Our hope is ideally to expand these conversations. Um, I think a good example is if we had a program like this with the current um, Penn Hollow project, we could have br brought in all of those people together and, and had conversations um, so that everyone in the community is on the same, on the same page. And so while we lead off with, with a segment of nonprofits, hopefully, and, and in a kind of educational basis, my, my goal would be to see this program grow into much more than that. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Next up, the approval of grants and donations. Uh, first up, the approval of Homeland Security Grant Award from the U.S. Department of Safety for the Seacoast Emergency Response Team, or CERT, to purchase search and rescue equipment to the tune of $29,024.39. Sample motion moved to approve and accept the grant from the police department as presented. So moved, Jeremy. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Next is a uh, approval of donation from Wilcox Industries for Portsmouth Police Honor Guard to attend specialized training 
as well as attend the Police Memorial in Washington, D.C. This year, Portsmouth Police K-9 Max will be added to the memorial following his 2019 line of duty death. Uh, and this is the amount of $5,000. A sample motion moved to approve and accept the donation for the police department as presented. So moved. Second. All in favor? Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. sorry. Um, I do have a question, if sure. I can. Um, I found um, this donation uh, left me with some questions about donations that come into the, the city, um, specifically, um, in this case, it's coming to the police for a trip to Washington, D.C., which seems like a very reasonable um, ask as far as going on this trip. <coughs> but um, I was wondering if it's, if it's already budgeted for, or do we have, you know, these are the questions we, we don't necessarily have an answer to. Is there a budget in the police department already for this trip? Um, would they be able to go on this trip if they didn't receive the funds? I wouldn't be a person to ever turn away donations, but, um, but it just made me question um, how things are really budgeted um, and if we're relying on donations from the public to complete some of these, um, I guess, training uh, programs in particular. Let's see, who would be the best, uh, is that city manager? Um, can you, I guess, answer the first question of whether or not this was a budgeted item? I cannot answer whether it was budgeted. budgeted. My, my sense is no, I would want to coordinate with Acting Chief Maloney on this and report back to the council if that were okay with you. Sure. Um, the, I guess the question then is, do we want a report back on the process of departments receiving donations um, and is that separate from approving this donation to uh, the police honor guard and I guess that question is for Councillor Cook if I okay. might ask um, I, I would love to have a report back on uh, the no donations whether or not they're supplemental to funding or whether or not they are the funding that is paying for certain projects. And um, in this case, you know, I, I don't want to delay it in case this trip is sooner than we think. Um, and whether or not we approve this tonight impacts that directly. Um, I don't want to delay for a few weeks if that's a problem, going to be a problem for them. But that said, I would still like a report back so I understand the way this sure. is working. Um, Councilor Barty. Well, I, I wanted to talk to the, the point that you began making about a broader question. So maybe should that wait? Um, well, I, so I don't want to, so I feel like there is a, um, there is a, uh, a good conversation to be had and for public to understand what happens when a donation is given. Um, I think that, you know, things like the, the skate park, uh, is raising funds for an unbudgeted item of the lighting. Um, and so that's pretty clear. I think that whenever a, uh, a police organ or the police receive money in the form of a donation, uh, you know, it is, if the council, I will uh, not judge the police. If the council was, was to receive a donation for a council retreat, I think there would be questions upon, you know, what, uh, you know, what went into that process. Um, to accept that uh, donation and whether or not this was budgeted or, or not. So I think having a separate conversation around this would be something that I could expect to come from the governance committee um, down, the, down the road and might save for a separate motion at a later meeting and for us to tackle this, uh, this um, uh, donation separately from that um, would one course of action that we could we could go down. Is this the mayor? Did you have some? No. You covered it, right. Your Honor. So is the motion is there? The motion I, I believe is uh, is is there as uh, the sample motion, and we can and note we'll separately that we and second in, and that we would expect a conversation from the governance committee around uh, future donations. Right. To, 
put some uh, <coughs> guidelines for the public to understand what happens when a donation is received and if it's budgeted, you know, uh, or if it's not, uh, if it doesn't, uh, is it received, um, what happens to that, that event. Um, but I will, we will go forward with the sample motion. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. So next up is the acceptance of donation in the form of five $20 gift certificates from JL Nails and Spa on Woodbury Avenue for the Portsmouth Police Department. Sample this, motion. This is one that I think is a little strange. Um, Let's have the sample motion that we can have the discussion on. I'd make a motion that we uh, move to approve and accept donations for the police department as presented. Second. All right. And then, uh, Councilor Barty. I, um, it seems like this is personal. Uh, these are, this is a personal gift. It's, and I felt the same way about the the uh, invitation to Pontine Theater, which we all received, that um, it just it didn't seem right to, um, and I didn't go because I didn't feel it was, um, I, I don't know, it's just, it seemed like a gift that is, uh, you know, a benefit of being on the council, and it, that didn't feel right to me. And, you know, a nail salon, the giving gift cards um, seems like a, I don't see how it relates myself, I guess. Well, um, oh, so Council Moreau and then uh, the I Assistant Mayor. I guess I saw it in a slightly different light because I know we used to, when I was on the Board of Haven, get a lot of donations like this, and we would actually give them out to people in need as something for you know them, a victim, whatever the case may be. So I guess we would need to know if maybe this is part of something that they collect these from the community and which to give out. It's not technically, I think, for the police. It would be my idea that they're actually for other mm -hmm. people that they might need to help. Sister Mary, anything to add? Uh, I think you're on. I was just going to say, I think this is a good example of, I think, some of the concern of, of what is the internal policy uh, of individual departments. So I would potentially uh, move to do a friendly amendment to, to table this until we get a report back from the um, city manager on what is the internal policies of distribution and collection of gift cards if they stay internal versus being used. So that's a friendly amendment. Who made the amendment? I or made the motion. Who made the motion? Would that be considered a friendly amendment? Uh, I think I have to withdraw my motion so we can make a new motion to table this. So um, I don't think I can really make a friendly amendment to table. <laughs> okay. It's just my. <laughs> but I would be happy if it pleases uh, the assistant mayor that uh, we can table this to our next meeting um, and get that report back. To see if I'm right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Please assist second. <laughs> well, um, so we have a second on the withdrawal uh, or to table. To, to uh, table. Uh, okay. Um, again, I, I guess I would. Uh, I think that um, tabling the the, the hundred bucks and JL nails uh, and spa on Woodbury Ave and having previously passed the. $5,000 for the trip to the, uh, seems as though um, we would little, be, yeah. um, you know, so I, I would, I would hope that we could, um, well, I will, I will not be voting to table. I think it's a good discussion to have. Um, and I think, you know, understanding what the gift policy of uh, departments is important as it is important for the council's uh, gift. Um, you know, I, I hear, uh, stories of, of, you know, uh, and I haven't seen it in practice, but, uh, you know, police getting a free cup of coffee as a thank you for the, the, the community work that they do. Uh, and I don't know if this is any different than that, but I would like to understand if there's a limit, um, you know, and, and put rules in place or suggestions to other departments. Um, 
but I would not uh, at this moment be in favor of tabling this amendment, although I am in favor of having a conversation on this moving forward. Withdraw. So maybe I would I would withdraw my motion. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we could um, ask the governance committee or the city manager to report back on that if one exists or if not, maybe governance can set a policy if the one doesn't mm -hmm. already exist. Okay. So but I can go back to my original motion. Just to approve it. As a sample motion. Yeah. Yep. And then we can make under miscellaneous a motion to. Uh, yeah. We can do uh, that. For report back from the governance committee. Okay. Okay. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 Okay. Um, next up is the city manager's informational items. Uh, we had the McIntyre update. Um, oh, the uh, oh, this I'm stealing your thunder. You okay. can you steal can. away. <laughs> <laughs> the number one is um, dispatch with for the evening. Uh, number two is in your packet. We have the 2023 budget meeting schedule with the first meeting kicking off a week from tonight at 6:30, which will be the uh, opening public hearing. Uh, new this year for folks who are interested is a night of public dialogue on Thursday, May 19th, in which we will hold three simultaneous meetings from 5.30 to 6.30 in three different parts of the city. Each of those meetings will be manned or womaned by three city councilors and a member of senior staff. They will not be recorded. There will not be meeting minutes taken. They will be um, purely as intended to be public dialogue. One will be held at Fire Station 2. One will be held at the Senior Activity Center, and one will be held at the middle school. So we look forward to those. Those are new. Councilor Murrow. Can I just make a request that I get to go to the middle school because I have planning board that starts at 7 that night? Of course. And it'll make it easier for me to get there. It sits get on the there. record. <laughs> Councilor Murrow has gone on the record saying she I'm like, I looked at how far I'd have to travel from yeah. there, and I was like, okay, I need to be as close to City Hall as possible. Thank you. Okay. Next up would be the Household Hazardous Waste Collection Day coming up on May 21st. And there's a press release in your packet. That My favorite days. Do you all that information between You do a great and job. And yeah, thank you. Oh my I've lived here long enough that I even have stuff for Household Hazardous Waste Day now. Very right? <laughs> uh, Number three, I'm sorry, number four is a report back on fee waivers um, as initially requested by Councillor Denton, I believe. There's narrative in the city manager comments. Uh, long story short, there's currently a discount for military members and their families at the outdoor pool. There is not currently a discount in place for the boat launch. We've had some communication with the folks at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard Public Affairs Office. We've learned about their clientele and what they see as needs. And in deference to them and to understanding how best to move forward, it is the recommendation that the city continue to offer the discount. Um, quite frankly, as personnel, in their words and in their sharing, um, is accustomed to a discount, and free could potentially create a capacity issue at the pool that may be an unintended consequence. Less, um, less so would be a, a potential loss in revenue. The other consideration would be for um, the city to continue offering the military discount as is, but what we'd like to continue, what we'd like to propose to the council would be to host a military appreciation day for, during the summer at both the outdoor pool and the boat launch, where we could publicize that that's free admission for military members and their families with the potential to make that an annual event. And as uh, currently stated, there, there's no discount at the boat launch. We, we could recommend and feel comfortable recommending a military discount of 50% off all fees at the boat launch. First and foremost, thank you. The uh, primary impetus why I initially proposed was the fact that there are 147 uh, children in Kittery schools who are dependents of active duty military. And I was pleased to learn that they currently do not have to pay as children of military. That's great news for the pool. Uh, likewise, the $2 for the military and their uh, spouses is also very welcome news. And I love the idea of doing the 50% discount at the boat launch for uh, military. So, thank you. Great. Um, just to close the loop on this conversation, I checked with the city attorney and was 
reminded that this matter did if this were the will of the council to undertake these recommendations this would not need to go to the fee committee is that correct oh, your honor. Yeah. you just called me your honor <laughs> 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 I don't know if we need a, a roll call vote or a vote of any kind, but we could we could make those changes if it were the will of the council to do so. Is, is it cleaner to get a vote on that? Uh, it's definitely within the policy of the city council, and a vote of the council is all it would take. I motion to adopt the discussed fees. Second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Thank you. Number five relates to a request I believe the mayor made on the feasibility of locating a coast bus stop on Greenleaf Woods Drive. We've had conversations among staff with the staff at Coast and in your packet you'll see a memo memorializing the conversations between Planning Director Zent and myself. We also provided the backup front which uh, includes email co correspondence from Coast Executive Director Brad Nichols to our Parking Director Ben Fletcher. Long story short, it is something, um, uh, the request would be a significant alteration of the route that Coast would need to assess. It may impact stops that they have near Crossroads and near Portsmouth High School, which are well utilized. God bless you. So it, it is something that they'd be willing to take into consideration. And of note, there's a new board member on Coast, and it is a woman who is the chief development officer for Families First. So. This is not something they can accommodate at this time, but they said they would work to incorporate this into their planning efforts. Great. And lastly, Your Honor, is a memo from City Engineer Terry Damaris relative to the two wastewater permits issued by uh, the EPA and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services through the National Pollutant <laughs> Discharge Elimination System, or NIPDES. So Terry really wanted to make sure the council knew that we um, received uh, those permits and we're we've been given an extension on a time to provide comments back as you can imagine getting one is is large and two is doubly large so uh, staff is working diligently to prepare comments to those permits and we will bring you an update as soon as we have one thank you city manager thank you now if there's anything from miscellaneous we've already gone past uh, 10 30 uh, so I think we, we do need a Let's get this uh, this this motion uh, on the table from miscellaneous on uh, a request to report back on donations. Your Honor, I move that um, the city manager reports back on um, individual uh, department policies and city standard policies of acceptance of donations and gifts. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Anything else? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I just want to remind everyone to think blue and to come to the Clean Water Forum tomorrow night, 6 to 8. Uh, we'll go on Zoom, but I know we mentioned it a long time ago, but think blue, Portsmouth, and uh, yeah, help participate, <laughs> please. Thank you, Councilor Bailock. Anything else? All right. I'll wait a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good night, Portsmouth.